My name is Ed Flynn, and I am the City Council President. Viewers can watch the City Council meeting live on YouTube by visiting boston.gov slash citycouncil-tv. I'd like to ask all my colleagues and those in the audience to, pe to please silence your cell phones, electronic devices at this time. I'd also like to ask everyone here, my colleagues and the public, to be respectful of each other. Do not disrupt the meeting while you are here. If you are disruptive, we will ask that you, we will ask that you will leave, and if you fail to comply, you might be escorted out. Please also note that according to City Council rules, there are no signs allowed in the chamber. Roll call, Mr. Clerk, will you please call the roll to ascertain the presence of a quorum, please? Councilor Braden, Councilor Coletta, Councilor Fernandez Anderson, Councilor Flaherty, yeah. Councilor Flynn, yeah. Councilor Lara, Councilor Lujan, Councilor Mejia, Councilor Murphy, yeah. and Councilor Worrell. A quorum is present. I have been informed by the clerk that a quorum is present. Today's introduction of the clergy. Um, I'd like to ask City Councilor Bach to please come up, introduce our clergy for today's meeting. Councilor Bach. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Um, it's, it's my pleasure today um, to introduce Pastor Jamie from um, Tremont Temple Baptist Church. Uh, we actually, the council recently had an item on our docket um, to make Tremont Temple a landmark. So it's now a landmark in the city of Boston, a recognition that's long overdue. It's a Baptist congregation that's existed since the 19th century um, and has a very famous building. It's been host to um, many, many great speakers uh, over the years and also just a vibrant congregation for uh, well north of a century now. Um, and I think is also perhaps on the docket for Community Preservation Act funding. So um, really like one of those kind of treasures uh, of the city architecturally, um, but also spiritually. And so we're very grateful um, to have Pastor Jamie here with us. Um, the church is affiliated with um, American um, Baptist, uh, the American Baptist Church and also the Southern Baptist Church um, actually hosts uh, Send Relief in its building, an organization um, that works with uh, refugees and um, on human trafficking issues. Uh, and um, the Congregation itself is an important part of uh, the local religious tapestry. So um, Pastor Jamie, he's been at the church for eight years. Um, before that was serving down in Providence, um, before that in DC. Um, uh, did a master's of theology with a focus on preaching from the Gordon Conwall Theological Seminary. Um, and uh, in addition to ministering to his congregation, um, uh, also uh, uh, cares for his family, um, his wife Adriana, and they have uh, four children, Mercy, Audrey, Jack, and Noah. Um, so I was reaching just over the line into Councillor Flynn's district um, for this clergy invitation, but I just thought that uh, in this season of acknowledging Tremont Temple um, and its importance in the history of the city, uh, we would love to um, welcome Pastor Jamie to the rostrum. Thank you. Well, it's an honor to open up in prayer, and a special thank you to Councillor Bach for inviting me here. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father in heaven, you are a great God, the living God, the only God. You are righteous and just and yet you abound in steadfast love and faithfulness. You are the creator and sustainer of the galaxies, majestic in holiness, transcendence, and set apart from your creation, and yet in compassion you have moved to redeem this fallen world. As the creator, you are creation's judge, the one to whom everyone must give an account, and yet you are a tender father towards those who trust in you. O oh Lord, I approach your throne of grace in prayer to ask for wisdom to govern in these times of trial. You know that we are in desperate times as a nation and a city. In your word, the psalmist asks, if the foundations are destroyed, what shall the righteous do? Surely wisdom calls us to look to you, to the sovereign Lord. And you have declared in your word that the times are in your hands. 
I pray that this council will boldly and courageously face an unknown future, both in their personal lives and as city councilors, drawing confidence not in their own virtue and abilities or in their own grit and resolve, but in your power and your love. I pray for the vulnerable of our city, for the homeless, for many of our veterans, for those caught up in sex trafficking and the drug trade. I pray for victims of violence and for their families, for children who are at risk of harm and abuse, and for so many others. And I also pray for the first responders, for the medical staff, for the shelters and churches throughout this city, and for so many others who render care. Oh Lord, you are a God who is near to the brokenhearted, a God who saves the crushed in spirit. I pray that you would be near to them to provide, protect, and comfort them. I pray particularly that the work of this council would be a display of your own compassion and care for the least of these. May these council members burn with passion to see the hurting healed and the wounded made whole. May they love justice and mercy and display it in their efforts to alleviate suffering in the city of Boston. I pray also that each member of the council would be marked by integrity, by a disinterestedness that lends to the care of others, that the flourishing of this great city and all who move within it would be their greatest concern so that justice would roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. I pray that you would guard each counselor from desires and temptations for dishonest gain. Give each one an aversion to corruption. Cause them to be the same people in the darkness as in the light of this chamber, that the reputation of this council and this city will gleam for many years to come. I pray also that collectively, as the legislative body over this city, that their use of authority, though it will not be perfect, will reflect your very own. I pray now for the city of Boston in the words of your departed servant, King David. When one rules justly over men, ruling in the fear of God, he dawns on them like the morning light, like the sun shining forth on a cloudless morning, like rain that makes grass to sprout from the earth. I pray that under the guidance of this council, the city of Boston, its institutions, its residents, and all who pass the time in her streets will flourish like well-watered fields. And finally, I pray that your love, supremely displayed in the sin-bearing death of Jesus Christ, in his glorious resurrection, would be known and trusted among the members of this council. Thank you for sending your son to bear in his own body the guilt for sin for all those who trust in you. O oh Lord, grant to this council blessings and joy as they serve us, and may your name be glorified among the members of this body. I pray this all in the strong name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. At this time, would everyone please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Pastor, for those inspiring words. Mr. Clerk, can you ensure the record is reflected to include Councilor Braden, Councilor Collada, Councilor Fernandez Anderson, Councilor Lara? Yeah. We do have several presentations. We're going to ask various city councils to come forward. I believe we have four of them, but at this time, I would ask Councilor Aaron Murphy to come forward um, <clears throat> to the podium, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for coming, and as you see, we have many members of the licensing board and other workers is 
Peter's wife here. Could I ask, oh, could you, would you like to come up? No, or does somebody want to come up with her maybe? Whatever you Thank you, Diana. So, um, as many of you probably know, there was Diana's husband passed away suddenly, and so many of her co-workers are here, and we wanted to take a moment here on the city council floor to just acknowledge you and how wonderful your husband was. So, Kwa Kwa Wong, better known to many of us here in this chamber as Peter, was a joy to his wife, Diana co-workers who we see many here in the chamber today in the city of Boston. Peter moved from Hong Kong, his birthplace, to Boston in 1980, where he attended Elliott Elementary School, followed by Boston Tech. By 18, he began his first job as a youth counselor with Boston Asian Youth Essential Services. There, he served as a mentor and a guide for many children in the city. After that, Peter took up yet another job with a focus on helping people, this time in City Hall. Peter began as an administrative clerk for the Department of the Licensing Board and moved his way up in position during his time spent there. He was always there to help his colleagues, whether it was assisting in an administrative task or simply cheering them up. As for his constituents, he was kind, patient and always willing to help anyone who needed assistance. He and his wife, Diane, were inseparable. She loved his home, cooked meals, and getting to travel the world with him. This year would have been their 25th wedding anniversary. The spirit of Quok Peter will live on in City Hall and in the city of Boston for years to come. He was a blessing to his wife, his co-workers, constituents, and anyone who ever had the privilege of meeting him. So, would you like to say something? Yeah, Councillor Baker. Um, I just want to say on behalf of the City Council and the City, and sorry for your loss and the loss in the City, um, the licensing department, everybody that knew and loved Peter, um, thank you him for his service and this is just a small thing and in, in one of the things that we can do just to show you support and let you know that we're here with you your city family peter's city family here and want to just make sure that you feel supported and make sure that you're okay um and that and that's about it thank you and and we have a we had a resolution that that was part of Peter's Peter's service also that came from the city council, and th there's no words that we have that can that can make it okay. But as long as we can can send a collective prayer for Peter that that he's he's in a better place now. That's what we believe, and that's that's difficult to for you to believe now, but hopefully you can. And time will time does heal wounds. So. Thank you, and, and, and sorry for your loss. You're welcome to say something if you want, or we just go back. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Peter's co work is welcome. They're here for you. Thank you, licensing, for coming out and supporting us and supporting Peter and Diana. Thank you, Councillor Baker. Thank you, Councillor. Murphy. Thank you to the licensing team for being here as well. At this time, 
I would ask Council Alara to come forward for another presentation. Council Alara. And, and Mr. Clerk, can we ensure the record is reflected that Councilor Worrell is present? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Uh, Councilor Lara. Thank you so much, President Flynn, uh, and thank you to Councilor Murphy and Councilor Baker for uh, that beautiful presentation. Our office sends its condolences um, to Peter's family. I am here today and really honored to be starting Women's History Month by celebrating a trailblazing woman whose leadership and impact withstand the test of time. Today, I have Matthew White, Helen Walsh, and Connor White on behalf of Ms. Carol White to receive um, this citation. Ms. Carol White has been a noted community member and a real estate broker in West Roxbury for over 40 years and has just crossed the amazing milestone of turning 90 years old this year. Mrs. White is one of the first pioneers of women in real estate field and starting Carol White and Associates Real Estate as one of our city's first women-owned real estate companies right in her kitchen. She has been servicing the communities in and around West Roxbury for decades and was named 2019's number one, number one brokerage firm in Boston. Carol White is a name that is synonymous with real estate in West Roxbury and Rosendale. In her many years in the field, she has mentored many of her current real estate brokers in West Roxbury who started their journey with her. A clear testament of her mentorship is the success of the women that she's paved the way for. It's safe to say that in the la landscape of West Roxbury would look very, very different if it not for Carol. Her ties with city government also run pretty deep. Carol is the sister-in-law of former mayor Kevin White. He was quoted saying this about Carol. Just as she is a wonderful community advocate, she is a wonderful business person. I cannot say enough about her. Carol is very proud of her five children, Brendan, Deidre, Sarah, Matthew, and the late Timothy as well as her grandchildren, Brendan, Taylor, Mickey, and Connor. Her passion, love, and kindness have been known over many generations in West Roxbury, and I'm honored to present this official City Council citation for Ms. Carol White. Thank you very much, Council Lara. Uh, I also want to mention BJ, who was very, very helpful uh, in, 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 you know, getting this off the ground um, with Council Lara's office. Thank you to the Boston City Council, uh, Council President. Um, you know, when I was coming in here this morning, I uh, happened to see my my grandfather Joseph C. White, who was the Council President in 1954 as well. So I snapped a nice picture of that. Um, uh, but I'm here on behalf of my family, Helen, Connor, uh, my, my brother Brendan, sister Deirdre, other sister Sarah, my late brother Timothy, and of course for my mother Carol White, who was uh, an institution um, in the West Roxbury, in greater West Roxbury area, in Boston area. Uh, she, I'm very proud of her, the family's very proud of her for all of her accomplishments and what she's done for us uh, as a family and for her kids. So uh, she just uh, celebrated her uh, 90th birthday recently in early January. It was a beautiful, beautiful event. So I could go on and on, but uh, I'm very, very grateful, Council Lara, and to, to everybody to express uh, just my gratitude uh, for the city of Boston uh, and for, uh, for my mom on behalf of everybody. Uh, she's a beautiful person. She's watching this now. Um, she couldn't come here herself, but we have the citation in hand and another uh, beautiful event for her. So thank you very much, everybody. Could my colleagues please come up for a group photo? Thank you.
Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So we say hello. No, thank you. Welcome. Welcome back. Good seeing you, right? Good seeing you. And I like your outfit. Thank you, President Fush. Thank you. Thank you. It was good seeing you again. Thank you. Thank you, Council Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you could take that. We have, we have two more presentations left at this time. Let me ask City Councilor Tanya fernandez Anderson to please come forward. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, today, I would like to honor uh, Dr. Uh, Will Flavel is um, Dr. Will Flavel. Um, where, where do you go? Okay, if you can please join me here, please. Okay. Um, Dr. Will Flavel is an indigenous educator, politician, scholar, and social justice advocate from Auckland, New, Zeal New Zealand. As the first ever Maori member to be elected to the Auckland Council in 2013, serving the Henderson uh, Massey, Massey, thank you, area of 130,000 constituents, and we're complaining, right? He has been a strong advocate for the Maori community, emphasizing and ensuring the community's viewpoints are actively involved in the decision making and resourcing of Maori arts, culture, and history to be more visible in public spaces. With a background in secondary school education, he has a passion for helping young people find their place in the world while supporting their aspirations. He is currently a Fulbright scholar working with indigenous young people of Massachusetts as part of his fellowship and will return to New Zealand in April. Please help me honor today, Dr. Will Flavel. Give us a couple of minutes. Yeah, thanks. Ke akunui, ke e te ti, e te tā, e ngā kaitiaki takitaki o tēnei takiwā Massachusetts, mihi aroha atu ki a koutou, e pūpuri tonu ana ki te mana o tēnei whenua. E te koromato a Boston, a mea wū tēnā koe, ka huri o kumihi maioha ki ngā kai kaunehera tēnā koutou. Firstly, I acknowledge the indigenous guardians of this land, their traditions, culture and languages. I acknowledge mea wū, um, Chairman Flynn and Councillor Anderson for the invitation and the councillors here in the chambers this afternoon. My name is Dr. Wu Flavel. I'm an Indigenous educator, social advocate, researcher, and local Auckland City politician. My tribes are Ngāpuhi, Ngāti Whātua, Tainui, and Ngāti Maniapoto. I'm here in Boston for a short time, representing my Indigenous communities, my home of West Auckland, and my country, Aotearoa, New Zealand. The last month has been difficult for people back home in New Zealand. Flooding has caused widespread devastation, impacting the daily lives of many families and communities. As a result, people have died. Climate change is real and needs immediate resourcing to counterattack the effects of such devastation. This is important as New Zealand is an island nation with many coastal towns and communities. I am here in Boston because I received a Fulbright Scholar Award for four months to understand the schooling experiences of indigenous young people in Massachusetts and whether they can see their culture, language and identity feature in their schooling experiences. Interviewing young people in school visits will give me a greater understanding of Indigenous schooling experiences. As Māori, Indigenous people of Aotearoa, New Zealand, it's our obligation that we support Indigenous communities around the world. We have faced similar histories. 
We're slowly improving things back home. This year, teaching New Zealand history, including local Indigenous stories, is now a core compulsory component of the New Zealand education system. This will provide a more inclusive insight into all our histories, good and bad, to children back home. People must know the past in order to understand the present and to face the future. Last year, we celebrated a new public holiday, Matariki, the cluster of Pleiades stars that signal, signals the Māori New Year. It is an important time for the year for us to honour our ancestors, celebrate the present by giving thanks and plan for the year ahead. What is particularly special about this public holiday is that each year is a different day depending on the changing lunar calendar system. I was first elected to Auckland Council in 2013. For the last year, 10 years, I have straddled the life of a local politician with my role as an educator. During that time, we have seen the renaming of 100 parks, reserves and community centres with Māori names. This is in partnership with our local tribes. They are resourced to give the community meaningful names that tell their local stories. We now have announcements on our public transport systems, both trains and buses, in the Māori language. This ensures that we increase the visibility of the language as a community language that is seen, heard, read and felt. Diversity only exists when the voices of Indigenous communities are heard. There has been success in supporting our people's dreams and aspirations. This came with struggle, protests, marches, gatherings and petitions. We still have a lot of work to do. Being at the decision-making table means ensuring that our decisions today will make it easier for the next generation. Sometimes those decisions can be difficult, but it is necessary. It has to be like that. I'll finish today with a Māori proverb. Mā te kimi ka kite. Mā te kite ka mōhio. Mā te mōhio ka marama. Seek and discover. Discover and know. Know and become enlightened. Nō reira, huri noe te whare nei, te nā koutou, te nā koutou, te nā koutou katoa. Thank you very much. The final presentation we have is by City Councilor Brian Worrell. Council Worrell, will you please come to the podium. Thank you, President Flynn, and um, just want to say thank you to um, everyone who stopped in to watch a screening of the quiet room. And um, if you weren't able to make it to the screening, um, I encourage you to uh, go find it online. It's a very moving field that just brings you closer to the realities of families uh, that are impacted by gun violence. Um, with the understanding that the stories we tell shape the questions we ask and the solutions we develop, Emerson University, MGH, and the Louis D. Brown Peace Institute teamed up to establish transforming narratives of gun violence. In a relatively short history, TNG has been willing to question every aspect of our approach to gun violence, from what we talk about and how we talk about it, to whose voices are emphasized and whose leadership we follow. Their work has spanned formats ranging from documentaries and stage performances to digital and virtual reality all centered around informing, inspiring, and building community. Um, and one thing I do like about um, uh, TNG is that they do center community um, in all their conversations and all their work. Uh, transforming narratives of gun violence seeks to reframe our understanding of cyclical violence in our communities, shifting the story to highlight not just weaknesses, but also assets, 
highlighting the ongoing resilience and determinations of communities in face of systemic failures. Using multidisciplinary media projects, community conversations, and collaborative leadership, they forward anti-racist, human-centered, collaborative projects to break through political boundaries and emphasize the strengths of our diverse communities. Their work, as well as the individual work of Emerson, MGH, and the Peace Institute are invaluable to our communities as they work to protect lives, heal wounds, and build resilient communities. I would love Pace and his team to come up so I could present them with a, um, a citation. Deep appreciation, everybody, for um, this, this acknowledgement of the Lewis D. Brown Peace Institute and those that we work in partnership with. Many of those partnerships come from direct endorsement and funding and support from this council. So um, with that, I share deep um, gratitude on behalf of Lewis D. Brown Peace Institute and thankful for the partnership with Mass General Hospital, Emerson College, um, to, in an effort to transform the narrative of gun violence. Um, and the way that we do that is we uplift the narratives of survivors, those that are closest to the pain, being closest to the power and closest to that narrative. And the Lewis D. Brown Peace Institute is a place, um, it's a center of healing, teaching and learning for those impacted by homicide and gun violence. Um, and it is a space where that narrative is encouraged and welcomed. And we look forward to continue working with partners, both at City Hall and across the city and across the state to make more spaces conducive to the stories and the narratives of survivors of homicide victims. And this is a beautiful first step working with Emerson College. So again, echoing um, Council Wells' invitation to watch the short documentary film, Quiet Rooms, is 20 minutes long. And if um, you've checked your, your um, mailbox, I left a, a flyer there that has a QR code to make it really easy for you. It's a 20 minute film um, uplifting survivor voices in this city, your constituents, um, and bringing their narrative to this building has been a really privilege, a great privilege today. So thank you for this acknowledgement. Thank you. Can your colleagues come forward for a photo, please? The first order of business. <clears throat> which is the approval of the minutes, seeing and hearing no discussion on the matter. The chair moves to approve the minutes from the last meeting. All those in favor of approving the many minutes from the last meeting say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay, the ayes have it. Thank you, the meeting, minutes of the last meeting stand as approved. Communications from her honor the mayor. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket? 0445, please. Docket number 0445, message disapproving a petition for a special law. 
regarding an act relative to the reorganization of the Boston School Committee, amending Chapter 108 of the Acts of 1991, Docket Number 0135, passed by the City Council February 15, 2023. Thank you. This docket will be placed on file. Mr. Clerk, the next uh, docket, 0446, 0447, please. Docket number 0446, message in order approving a supplemental appropriation for the Public Health Commission for fiscal year 23 in the amount of $50,850 to cover the fiscal year 23 cost items contained within the collective bargaining agreement between the Public Health Commission and the SEIU Local 888 coordinators assistant coordinators unit the terms of the contracts include base wage increases of 2 percent in October 2020 1.5 percent in October 21 and 2 percent in October 2022 docket number 0447 message in order to reduce the fiscal year 23 appropriation for the reserve for collective bargaining by fifty thousand eight hundred and fifty dollars to provide funding for the Public Health Commission for the fiscal year 23 increases contained within the collective bargaining agreements between the Public Health Commission and SEIU Local 888 Coordinator Assistant Coordinators Unit. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Council Bach, the Chair of the Committee, City Services, Innovation Technology. <coughs> Council Bach, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Um, seeing as this is just a $50,000 um, appropriation, uh, I am going to ask for suspension and passage of these two dockets today. Um, as is mentioned in the docket, it's for the uh, coordinators and assistant coordinators unit um, at BPHC. It's comprised of about 85 supervisory employees who work in the Homeless Services Bureau and in residential programs in the Bureau of Recovery Services. Um, this docket, it's, it's sort of part of the old wage pattern, so it's the October 22 is the 2 percent, then 1.5 percent, then 2 percent. Um, however, it also makes a change to the wage scales for the unit, so it, it's going to eliminate the lo current lowest step and add a new step that is 2 percent higher than the current top step, um, which increases both the starting and maximum salaries for bargaining unit positions. Uh, it also formally adds Juneteenth as a recognized holiday, as we've been doing, um, clarifies existing annual influence, influenza vaccination requirement to improve administrative efficiency, and it um, replaced obsolete case management titles and job descriptions with updated titles and descriptions that better align with the mission of the Homeless Services Bureau and the specific functions of the positions. Um, so yeah, it's uh, 85 employees over at BPHC. Um, obviously, they're <coughs> represented by SEIU 888, as are many um, uh, workers throughout the city, and uh, looking to get this ratified today. So Mr. President, um, with my colleagues' consent, I would love to suspend and pass both dockets, <coughs> 0446 and 0447. Thank you, Council Bach. We'll do each one individually. Council Bach seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0446. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The aye. Mr. Clerk, can we do a roll call vote? Yes, sir. Roll call vote on docket 0446, Council Arroyo. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker? Aye. Councilor Baker, aye. Councilor Bach? Yes. Councilor Bach, yes. Councilor Braden? Yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Coletta? Yes. Councilor Coletta, yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson? Yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, yes. Councilor Flaherty? Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn? Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Lara? Yes. Councilor Lara, yes. Councilor Lu Yes. Councilor Lu Zhen, yes. Councilor Mejia? Councilor Murphy? Councilor Murphy, yes. And Councilor Worrell? Yes. Councilor Worrell, yes. Docket number 0446 has received 12 votes in the affirmative. Thank you. This docket has passed. Council Block seeks, seeks suspension of the rules. Passage of docket 0447. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Do Mr. Clerk, can we do a roll call vote, please? Roll call vote on docket 0447. Councilor Arroyo? Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker? Aye. Councilor Baker, aye. Councilor Bach? Aye. Councilor Bach, aye. Councilor Braden? Yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Coletta? Yes. Councilor Coletta, yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson? Yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, yes. Councilor Flaherty? Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn? Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Lara? Yes. Councilor Lara, yes. Councilor Lu Yes. Councilor Louis Genius, Councilor Mejia, Councilor Murphy, yes. 
Councillor Murphy, yes. And Councillor Worrell? Yes. Councillor Worrell, yes. Document number 0447 has received 12 votes in the affirmative. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. This docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0448 <coughs> through 0450 together, please. Docket number 0448, message transmitting certain information under seven, section 17F relative to chronic absenteeism in Boston Public Schools for school years 2021 through 2022 and 2022 through 2023. Docket number 0419, passed by the Council on February 5th, on February 15th, 2023. Docket number 0449, message transmitting certain information under Section 17F relative to Boston Public Schools sexual assault and misconduct data for school year 2021 through 2022 and docket in school year 2022 through 2023. Docket number 0420, passed by the City Council on February 15th, 2023. Docket number 0450, message transmitting certain information under Section 17F relative to bus drop-off for English high school students. Docket number 0444, passed by the Council on February 15th, 2023. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. These dockets 0448 through 0450 will be placed on file. Reports of public officers and others. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0451, please. Docket number 0451, communication was received from the city clerk, transmitting a communication from the Boston Landmarks Commission for city council action on the designation of the Richards Building, downtown Boston, Mass., as a landmark, in effect after March 19, 2020, three if not acted upon. Thank you. This talk at 0451 will be referred to the Committee on Planning, Development, Transportation. Reports of committees, Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0117 and 0116 together. Docket number 0117, the Committee on Environmental Justice, Resiliency and Parks, to which was referred on January 11th, 2023. Docket number 0117. Message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $870,000 in the form of a grant for climate resiliency, for climate resilience awarded by the Barr Foundation to be administered by the Environment Department. The grant will fund the continued implementation of climate ready Boston initiatives. This includes advancing coastal resilience and heat resilience strategies prioritizing equitable electrification, and creating a community tree care program. Submits a report recommending that the docket ought to pass. And docket number 0116, the Committee on Environmental Justice, Resiliency, and Parks, which was referred on January 11, 2023. Docket number 0116, message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $1,633,500 in the form of a grant for the resilient Moakley connectors awarded by the Federal Emergency Management Agency passed through the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency to be administered by the Environment Department. The grant will fund pre-construction planning and design activities in the northern and southern areas adjacent to Moakley Park located along the waterfront in, of Dorchester and South Boston neighborhoods. The project is separate but complementary to the flood mitigation project within Moakley Park. Submits a report recommending that the docket ought to pass. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. The Chair recognizes Council Alara, the Chair of the Committee on Environmental Justice, Resiliency Parks. Council Alara, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. The committee held a hearing on Thursday, February 23rd, 2023. I was joined by Councilor at Large Michael Flaherty and received a letter of absence from Councilor at Large Aaron Murphy. Uh, Dr. Allison Brezius, the Commissioner of Environment and Department, testified on behalf of the administration during this hearing. The administration <coughs> testified that docket number 0116 will build on a number of years of community engagement and work to help Boston prepare for the effects of climate change. It was confirmed that the planning and design process will be done not only in collaboration with community partners and neighborhood organizations, but also with the Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation and the Massachusetts Water Resource Authority, as they are also holders of critical infrastructure that's adjacent to Moakley Park. 
Ultimately, docket number 0116 is a grant that is supplemental to the $34 million project that's already happening at Moakley Park and will ultimately help implement all of the interventions um, identified by Climate Ready Boston in the surrounding area while the project at Moakley Park is also happening. The administration testified that docket number 0117 would support ongoing efforts to increase climate resilience across the city um, through funding increased staff capacity. And so this grant from the Barr Foundation is going specifically to hire project managers and they'll be working to advance and implement a number of resilience priorities across the city uh, that were also identified through Climate Ready Report, including coastal resilience, heat resilience, energy resilience, and increasing tree canopy. There were questions that were raised um, regarding the tactical effectiveness of whether the grant could go towards doing more offensive flood mitigation projects rather than defensive ones. And the administration explained that as a part of the Climate Ready Boston study in 2016, their comprehensive study around the harbor concluded that while it may help during a storm, it's ultimately not going to solve the problems that are going to be caused by sea level rise on the coast. But they assured us that they would continue to revisit the idea while carrying out other projects like the ones funded under this grant. At my request, the administration also agreed to update the council on community engagement initiatives and keep the district councilors specifically involved throughout the process. I was very glad to be joined by Councilor Flaherty. Uh, as the chair of this committee, we oftentimes get projects and grants that come through the committee that are really centered on specific neighborhoods, and Councilor Flaherty had a depth of knowledge uh, in the projects that were happening in the surrounding neighborhood already. And so it's really important to me that the community not only be involved, but that uh, the city councilors that represent that area are also involved as these multiple projects move forward. So as the chair of the Committee on Environmental Justice, Resiliency, and Parks, to which the following dockets were referred, I recommend that these dockets ought to pass. Thank you, President Flynn. Thank you. Um, Council Aura seeks acceptance of the committee report, passage of docket 0116. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it, docket 0116. Council Aura seeks acceptance of the committee report, passage docket 0117. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it, docket 0117 has passed. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0407, please. Docket number 0407, the Committee on City Services and Innovation Technology, to which was referred on February 15, 2023. Docket number 0407. Message in order for your approval and order at the recommendation of the Chair of the Board of Election Commissioners I hereby transmit for your approval, your approval of your honorable body in order fixing the date of the preliminary election for this municipal year as September 12th, 2023. Submits a report recommending that the order ought to pass in a new draft. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. The chair recognizes Council Bach, the chair of the Committee on City Services, Innovation Technology. Council Bach, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Um, we held this hearing uh, back last Friday morning. I want to thank Commissioner Anita Tavares, who joined us, along with uh, Sabino Pimonte, um, who is the head re assistant registrar of voters at the election department and famous tall counselors. Um, we, I was also joined by my colleagues, Councillor Murphy and President Flynn, um, and we received a, a letter of absence from Councillor Louis Chen. Um, the basic topic of this order and what we were discussing is the fact that with the state having made mail-in voting permanent um, and the ability to offer early voting permanent, um, both good innovations for voter access in the city of Boston, um, the kind of statutory standard timeline where the <coughs> primary preliminary in the, the preliminary in the municipal elections happens six weeks before the general really no longer works in terms of ballot printing timelines um, when you want to actually get it into the mail and to people's doors and then back to us. Um, and so the request here um, is to move the preliminary date up from where it would be by default, um, which is uh, September 26th, that Tuesday, up to, as the order says, September 12th, um, so that there is enough time for elections to certify the results and then do the ballot order draw and order the ballots and have them back and get them out to everybody's requested a mail-in ballot with a, with a gracious amount of time for people to return those mail-in ballots. Um, we talked about the fact that obviously this problem isn't going to go away, so I think the council can expect 
in the near term that elections will come back to us with a more permanent fix because it doesn't make sense to have to do an order like this every municipal election from now till eternity. So, um, so they are working on a more permanent um, fix to bring to us uh, and that would take the form of a home rule petition because it would be a change to the um, to the charter and uh, we would and would probably also involve the streamlining of some other um, kind of outdated details about how the forms and stuff are set up by elections. But that's not what's in front of us today. What's in front of us today is just um, moving the prelim to September 12th, um, which fortunately is, you know, it's a full week obviously after Labor Day weekend. It's not one of these where we're talking about the day after Labor Day weekend, which I'm always skeptical of as an election date. Um, the, the way in which the order was amended was just that the intention of the elections department and what they filed was to say we're moving the prelim date, but we're not moving all the other deadlines for potential candidates. So there's a series of deadlines um, laid out for when people need to file a statement of candidacy, when they can show up and pick up nomination papers, when they need to turn nomination papers back in, um, when what's the deadline for folks to challenge, what's the deadline for folks to drop their names from the ballot, all that kind of stuff. And so, but none of that is as closely linked to the printing of the ballots issue. So elections intention was to move the date for the actual prelim two, to two weeks earlier, but not to also move all those other dates up on, on candidates by two weeks, because it's not necessary. Um, we just changed the language because it wasn't totally clear from the original order what the intent was, because it said like, oh, these dates shall remain unchanged, but the way these dates are described in law is in relationship to the preliminary election by a number of weeks. So. Arguably, they would have changed, even though it said they remained unchanged, um, since they were never set in the first place. Uh, so that's that's what the fix in the language is, but it's really to just do what the elections department had intended, which was to keep those dates this spring as though the prelim election were on September 26th, but to move the actual election up to the 12th. Um, the elections department has told us that they are ready to release the calendar um, as soon as they've got this from us. So I think people can expect to have that out this week, and obviously, that's a, um, a big agenda of theirs, is to just make sure that they can have information out equitably to all candidates as soon as possible, since the first of those deadlines starts to hit in April. Um, so with that, Mr. Chair, um, I would ask that this docket uh, be passed in a new draft as filed in the committee report. Thank you. Thank you, Council Block. Council Block seeks acceptance of the committee report, passage of docket 0407 in a new draft. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 0407 has passed in a new draft. Matters recently heard for possible action. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0151, please. Docket number 0151, order for a hearing to address contaminated beverages in clubs and bars. Thank you. The chair recognizes Council Flaherty, the chair of the Committee on Public Safety, Criminal Justice. Council Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We held a working session, the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice did yesterday. And uh, we got some updates uh, from the administration, from the licensing, from the police department. Uh, we also uh, uh, were joined by uh, State Senator Paul Feeney, who's taken a, a great lead on this uh, statewide effort, along with our lead sponsors, uh, Councilor Coletta, uh, Councilor Luigi, and Councilor Bark. Um, joined by several of my, my colleagues. A uh, couple takeaways, obviously, was that the Boston Police now have a box to check for responding officers and or detectives. Uh, there's now training around uh, how to sort of identify and how to classify that. And uh, that update uh, in the way that they handle those matters has resulted in 14 incidents uh, being reported uh, most recently. So those are sort of the positive steps that have been taken in conjunction with uh, listening to uh, advocates around uh, how to strengthen and make our uh, nightlife, our restaurants, our bars uh, safer for our residents and visitors alike. Uh, we heard uh, testimony from the licensing commissioner. We heard testimony from Boston police detectives. We heard um, support and, and testimony from BARC, which is the Boston Area Rape Crisis Center, as well as uh, representatives from the universities through BU's um, staff. So that said, uh, I'll defer. We obviously will be leaving it uh, in committee will be def deferred to the lead sponsor. She wants to add anything, but she's done tremendous lift on this. Again, working in partnership with our uh, colleagues up at the state level and in partnership, obviously, with the administration and the police department. But clearly, steps are being made in the right direction. Um, you know, the concept of contaminated drinks or also known as drink spiking or also known as uh, 
being roofied or roofing someone, all those are very serious uh, incidents that we know are happening uh, in our city and in our establishments. And so uh, the fact that uh, the lead sponsor and the co-sponsors have brought this to uh, everyone's attention and the fact that it's getting the much needed attention and this may also be something as you have referenced, Mr. President, during yesterday's hearing as we head into the budget season, maybe we need to uh, back that up with some additional resources. So everything from awareness and training are all big piece of it, but uh, there's also the part that when it happens to someone, they don't necessarily want to come forward or they're reluctant to come forward. But when they do come forward, there ought to be a test um, that is administered if they so choose at either a, a, a hospital or a, a health center. So insurance companies need to partner with us, testing companies need to. So this, is, uh, this has uh, a ways to go, but I think that's where we want it to go. We want to make sure that if it happens to anybody uh, in the city of Boston or in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, that you have the ability, you have the right to go get yourself tested uh, for one of those substances that it caused uh, you to, uh, to, to, to be under the influence of that uh, specific drug. Uh, and those tests should be readily available, if not in the establishments themselves or at an area hospital or health center or maybe some other social service agency that uh, is equipped and licensed to handle that type of stuff. So again, look forward to more uh, action on this, but uh, we'll defer it through the chair to the lead sponsor or co-sponsors if they want to add something. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Flaherty. The chair recognizes Council Coletta. Council Coletta, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. I just want to thank the chair and thank my co-sponsors, Councilor Louis Jen and Councilor Bach, for their partnership on this work. Um, I did see some progress. We did see some progress in this conversation, and that's exactly what you want to see in a working session following our hearing that took place in October. Um, and this was a follow-up conversation to move the ball forward. Uh, and, you know, there, there have been, even though there's been a slight decline in some of the messages that I'm getting from young women and men in our community, we want to make sure that we're setting up folks, patrons, uh, to feel safe if they're going to go out with their loved ones. And so I was pleased to hear movement within the Boston Police Department, and I just want to thank Lieutenant Detective Driscoll for his work in ensuring that we can even get that check mark in the Mark 45, or excuse me, Mark 43 system, and this way we can track patterns of behavior and be able to better identify where we need to have some of these preventative systems and technical, technical assistance in helping restaurant and bars put in maybe cameras or having lids uh, available in restaurants. And so I just want to thank him for that in addition to the, uh, the training uh, that was a commitment from the BPD. The licensing board, as Chair Flaherty mentioned, also came with additional steps uh, in light of recent incidents. They've put together an advisory committee of larger venues to uh, put forth an advisory uh, report or a set of guidelines for some of the smaller venues on, in terms of best practices and how to train their uh, bartenders and some of the servers in restaurants. They also committed to working with the Boston Area Rape Crisis Center so that that list of advisory um, checklists will actually be serving and meeting the needs of victims. And they also committed to a good uh, Samaritan, pol uh, Samaritan policy where if somebody were to come to them, if I'm an owner of a restaurant where this has happened, I'm not going to be penalized for maybe over-serving. Right? I want to make sure that if I'm going in front of the licensing board and I'm trying to ensure that a victim has justice, that I will not um, see any sort of penalties or fines. And so I'm also grateful for having Senator Paul Feeney join us, who is doing incredible work at the state. His piece of legislation is requiring ERs and hospitals to provide toxicology tests to anybody who says that they feel like they may have been drugged. And this is a barrier that we have identified in former conversations or, or prior conversations. And so I want to thank him for that. And also thank Ken Ryan from BU in attendance who has indicated an openness to maybe getting some toxicology kits at student health centers because we know that this largely happens on university and college campuses. So I do see access to adequate data, setting up data systems for collection, uh, breaking down barriers for access to uh, toxicology tests within that short window um, as necessary next steps. And so we want to continue this conversation. And I do appreciate the partnership from everybody on this, including uh, my co-sponsors and, and folks who had uh, showed up. And just thank you. And we will, um, we will make sure that our patrons feel safe uh, to go out whenever they do, please. So thank you. Thank you, Council Okoto. This talk at 0151 will remain in committee. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0118, please. 
Docket number 0118, message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $297,200 in the form of a grant for the fiscal year 23 Local Cultural Council Program awarded by the Massachusetts Cult Cultural Council to be administered by the Office of Arts and Culture. The grant will fund innovation, innovative arts, humanities, and interpretive sciences programming that will enhance the quality of life in our city. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilor Coletta, the chair of the Committee on, on Arts, Culture, Special Events. Councilor Coletta, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. Uh, as mentioned, the Committee on Arts, Culture, and Special Events held a public hearing on February 27th, 2023, here in the Ionella Chamber to take testimony and consider docket 0118, a message, in author, a message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $297,200 in the form of a grant. Uh, those in attendance, uh, well, before I go to that, letters of support and attendance were sent for the record by Council President Ed Flynn and Councilor Aaron Murphy. Uh, those in attendance from the administration uh, was Chief of Arts and Culture from the Mayor's Office, Kara Elliott Ortega, Nadia Far uh, Ferraria, Director of Administration and Finance, uh, and then also Fenny Mascari, Chief of Staff for the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture. Uh, the presentation included the specific use of these funds in various other related components, the background, history, jurisdiction, the processes of outreach, application, selection, allocation, and management by the Boston Cultural Council and the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture. This money will be allocated largely for the operational support of arts and culture organizations across the city of Boston. And they prioritized the smaller organizations with budgets, budgets under $100,000, which I um, certainly appreciated. I also had additional questions questions about um, taking in demographic data just to ensure that what we're doing now um, and, and how we move forward in the future um, is actually funding the arts in an equitable way here in the city of Boston. And they uh, promised to come back with some data on that point. So given all of this, uh, and based on the testimony and information presented at the hearing, and, have, and having considered the same, I respectfully recommend that this uh, matter ought to pass. Thank you, Councilor Cleta. Councilor Cleta seeks acceptance of the committee report in passage of docket 0118. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0323. Docket number 0323. Message in order for your approval. A proposed act to improve and modernize planning and community development in the city of Boston. Thank you. The chair recognizes <coughs> Council Arroyo, the chair of the Committee on Government Operations. Council Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you, Council President Flynn. Uh, the, com the Committee on Government Operations held the hearing on Monday, February 27th, on docket 0323, message in order for your approval, proposed a proposed act to improve and moderate, uh, modernize planning and community development in the city of Boston, which was sponsored by Mayor Wu. I'd like to thank my colleagues. We had uh, almost an entirely full house. Thank you to Council President Flynn. Thank you to Councilor Murphy, Councilor Mejia, Councilor Louis Jen, Councilor Lara, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Anderson, Councilor Coletta, Councilor Braden, Councilor Bach, and Councilor Baker for your attendance uh, and for your questions. <coughs> I also want to thank uh, the members of the administration for their attendance. Arthur Jemerson, uh, the Chief of Planning and Director of the BPDA, the Boston Planning and Development Agency, Lisa Harrington, General Counsel for the BPDA, uh, and Devin Quirk. Uh, Deputy Chief for Development and Transportation for the Boston Planning and Development Agency. This home rule petition as filed formally abolishes the Boston Redevelopment North Authority or BRA and the Economic Development and Industrial Corporation of Boston or the EDIC. Uh, this act transfers the powers and duties of those entities to an agency newly created by this act and formally adopts this agency as the Boston Planning and Development Agency. During this hearing, we heard from the administration on the intent of this home rule petition, which is to focus on urban renewal, uh, specifically sunsetting urban renewal uh, and modernizing the language uh, of the statute itself, but ensuring this is done by protecting communities that urban renewal currently covers. Uh, the administration also stated that the act allows for the transition of real estate tools, which could be used for a new purpose, while ensuring equity, affordability, and resilience. The Committee on Government Operations will hold a working session on this matter virtually on Friday, March 3rd at 10 a.m. Uh, so I hope to see uh, some of you there to discuss any specific language amendments uh, to this docket uh, to ensure we are sending the best possible version of this act to the State House. As Chair of the Committee on Government Operations, I recommend that this matter ought to remain in committee so that we can hold that working session. Thank you. Thank you, Council Royal. 
This docket 0323 will remain in committee. Motions, orders, resolutions. We're going to take docket 0463 out of order because we have some workers from Boston University in attendance, I believe. Uh, Mr. Clerk, <coughs> could we please read docket 03, I'm sorry, 0463. Docket number 0463, Councilors Bark and Braden offer the following. Resolution supporting of the residents life workers at Boston University. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Council Bach. Council Bach, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Mr. President, may I um, suspend Rule 12 and add Councilor Louis Jan as an original co-sponsor? Hearing no objection, Councilor Louis Jan is added. The Chair recognizes Council Bach. Thank you so much. Um, as I have said before, I am proud to have Boston University um, in my district, District 8, um, and I am even prouder of the workers who make it run. Um, and as of uh, February 13th, as it says in this um, docket, a majority of Boston University residents, life workers, signed authorization cards indicating their intent um, to unionize with uh, SEIU 509. Um, folks may well remember that uh, SEIU 509 um, had a successful organizing drive recently with the graduate workers um, at BU, which resulted in a vote of 14, 14 to 28. No, that's not a typo. Um, uh, and I think just really shows <coughs> how workers all over higher education um, and really all over the country are recognizing that collective bargaining is just extremely important um, to worker power, to, um, to kind of evening the dynamics with large employers, including when they're university and nonprofit employers. Um, you know, I think that uh, our resident life um, workers are in a kind of particularly precarious situation. Um, the RAs and graduate RAs um, at BU uh, rather than compensation, receive housing. Um, and I know that that you know, may sound to people like, well, that's an unusual you know, arrangement and it's not necessarily traditional work. It actually, you know, obviously it is. It's, it's, you'd otherwise be spending money on rent. Um, but it can put workers in a really awkward situation because, for instance, there are not clear policies around if a worker needs to take leave, um, if a worker like, is, is terminated, there's kind of no clear policy set. Um, and the problem for that, of course, is that you could get sick lose your job, and lose your housing all at once. Um, and so I think it's super important uh, you know, in a world in which the universities really rely on these workers um, at, again, the graduate and, and undergraduate level that, uh, that there be like, clear policies and expectations and, um, and that workers are able to have a voice in those, which is so important to kind of determining their lives. Um, so you know, there's been recently formed res life unions at Wesleyan University, Barnard College, and Tufts University. Um, some success at UMass Amherst recently as well. Um, and, uh, and we really uh, are excited to be supporting these workers. There's a group of them here with us today. Um, I do hope, Mr. President, that we might have a brief pause for a photograph in a minute. Um, but I, uh, the resolution before you today really just states that the council supports the BU Residence Life Workers Union and calls upon Boston University to ensure a fair and accessible union election process, um, something that I know that uh, this council has been consistently in favor of. Um, so I'm really grateful for uh, my colleagues, uh, Councillor Braden and Councillor Lujan, um, for joining me on this matter. Obviously, Councillor Braden has the bits of BU that I don't have, um, aside from uh, the medical campus. Um, and uh, yeah, we're just really excited to stand with these workers. As my button says, I stand with Res Life workers um, from BU today. So thank you, Mr. President. And please, we'd ask for a suspension and passage. Thank you, Council Bach. The Chair recognizes Council Braden. Council Braden, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Councillor Bach, for including me in this resolution supporting the Boston University Resident Life uh, Workers Union. Um, as Councillor Bach said, uh, I, I, BU is, seems like part of my universe out there in Alston Brighton and we have so many uh, um, uh, students from uh, BU who live and live and work in our neighborhood. Um, the resident assistants are student leaners and community builders. They're responsible for uh, addressing resident hall uh, uses, uh, rules. They're often the first university workers to respond to student conflict and crises 24-7. And in return, they receive housing and sometimes a meal plan. The workers are calling for equalised compensation for all types of RAs and a direct stipend. And they're also calling for better training and support for responding to issues that arise. 
Uh, and I also want to join the, the resident life workers calling upon BU to ensure a fair and accessible union election process. Uh, as Councillor Bach has already mentioned, this is a movement across the country that we start to recognise the important and valuable work that our st student workers are doing in, on our university campuses all across the, the country. And uh, I really want to stand in support of these workers today. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Braden. The Chair recognises Councillor louis Jean. Councillor louis Jean, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to Councillor Bach um, and Councillor Braden for um, adding me the, to this. Um, and so I am in support of the residence life workers, so thank you for your courage in organizing um, and, and standing up to the administration for what you need. Boston is a union city, and we are proud to support you in your unionization efforts. Me and my colleagues have been out there uh, supporting grad workers, and we will do the same for all of you. Um, what students are asking for, uh, student workers are asking for, is reasonable compensation, some sort of accommodation when there are emergencies that happen, when you're dealing and grappling with emergency issues among your residents. Many of us know who, those of us who have gone to college know that the uh, uh, our RAs had an incredible workload, and so we want to recognize that as work and the dignity in your work. And so I am um, happy to stand with you in your organizing efforts as Councillor Braden and Councillor Box stated. This is part of a national movement and we are happy to stand with you. So thank you for your courage and uh, thank you to my Councillor colleagues and uh, I'm hoping that we can pass this resolution today. Thank you, Councillor Louis-Jean. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter or add their name? Mr. Kirk, please <coughs> add Councillor Royo, Councillor Baker, Councillor Coletta, Councillor Fernandez Anderson, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Murphy, Councillor Rell, please add the chair. Councillor Bach, Councillor Braden, Councillor Louis Chen, seek suspension of the rules and adoption of docket 0463. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket has been adopted. And per the request of Councillor Bach, she is requesting a group photo. Um, so if my colleagues could come up. We'll take a brief recess. We're back in session. And I think Councillor Block is out of um, any more presentations going forward. <laughs> <clears throat> Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 0452? Um, and before we do that, um, 
I do want to acknowledge that I, I did want to take one out of, out of order, but I'm not able to do that because of, um, it's a late file. So apologize to another group that's still here. Um, but Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 0452? Docket number 0452. Councilors Braden and Louisiana offer the following. An ordinance providing remote access to meetings of municipal public bodies. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Councilor Braden. Councilor Braden, you have the floor. Well, thank you, Mr. President. This is a refile of ordinances initially filed in 2021 and in 2022 with a few substantive modifications. Uh, for some background, uh, certain provisions of the state's open meeting law were suspended in March of 2020 at the outset of the pandemic to enable public bodies such as our boards and commissions to do two things. <coughs> to hold mo meetings remotely without a quorum of members being physically present at a meeting location and to provide the public with adequate alternative access to remote meetings. The temporary suspensions were extended three times and of April 2022, July 2022 and are currently set to expire on March 31st, 2023 after 35 months. The state would need to pass legislation to make any permanent changes allowing members of public bodies to meet remotely or in a hybrid format. As of yesterday, there was a proposal from the House Ways and Means Committee to include an extension of the open meeting law suspension for a, two years to March 31st, 2025, as part of the supplemental budget. Regardless of what progre progresses at the state level, we are able to pass a local ordinance to permanently codify policies to continue providing the public with remote access options to attend and offer testimony at meetings. My office received confirmation from the uh, Inspectional Services Department that it intends to continue offering a remote access option for the public to attend and comment at ZBA meetings, either in person or remotely, beyond March 31st, while board members would be required to return to the meeting in person. While it's great that ISD and the ZBA are preparing for the anticipated expiration in 30 days, there are still dozens more boards and, com and co uh, commissions in the city. Recognising that there are boards and commissions of varying sizes and that some are limited in administrative and staffing capacity from city departments, this ordinance would require a body that regularly meets more than five times per year to provide the public with remote access while making it optional for all other public bodies. The requirements would not apply to committees or subcommittees of a public body, but they could choose to adopt these practices. Public notices would have to state whether there is a remote option component, specify whether public testimony will be taken, and whether testimony may be taken in person, remotely, or in writing, provide instructions on how to request disability or language access accommodations, and indicate whether a video recording, minutes or transcripts are available after the meeting and where to find or request them. This is about setting the standard for how we continue to engage people with disabilities, seniors, people with limited access to transportation and people with work and family obligations who would otherwise would be unable to attend a meeting in person. Regardless of what advances at the state level, I hope that we will be able to find a permanent solution to re maintain remote access for the public at the local level. Thank you for your consideration and I hope that we can uh, make this a more permanent uh, fix for our uh, communities. Thank you. Thank you, Council Braden. The Chair recognizes Council Louis-Jean. Council Louis-Jean, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you to Councillor Braden for adding me. Um, my office has um, really enjoyed working with your office on this issue. You know, the pandemic obviously wreaked havoc and continues to wreak havoc on a lot of our communities. Uh, but we did learn a few things, and we learned that we can bring more people into government. Democracy go, grows under the light of transparency and accessibility. We are a better city when every resident who wants to can participate and follow the deliberations of public meetings. 
Um, as I said, one of the silver linings that we learned from the pandemic is the enabling of remote participation in open meetings. We have seen a meaningful increase in resident engagement due to this ability to hold virtual and hybrid meetings um, during the pandemic. We know that many residents, as Councillor Braden stated, cannot attend in-person meetings due to family, school, and work obligations. Furthermore, residents with disabilities face particular and additional challenges with accessing in-person meetings. And we must continue to make it easier for black and brown residents and those historically excluded from government and public meetings uh, by calling them into the process. Democratic engagement is meaningfully higher when our residents can participate in open meetings online, thus making government more effective and accessible to all people. We don't know, although um, they're taking some action, we don't know exactly what the State House is going to do when uh, the provisions of the open meeting law expire. Um, officials may still be required to participate in person, but by allowing for hybrid hearings where the public can participate online, we would be offering residents meaningful opportunities to stay involved. Uh, besides the City Council, in our hearings, the City of Boston conducts a lot of public meetings for licensing, permitting, historical commission, community listening sessions, etc. Obviously, right now, we are talking as a city about the BPDA and really transforming that. Um, and I'm, I'm encouraged by a lot of that work, especially the part that involves being more intentional about how we engage community. And when we think about allowing for remote participation, I think that is part of the discussion. For many of us, virtual or hybrid hearings has made our work easier, but for residents, as those who have a disability or those working two jobs or those managing a family or those who have been historically excluded, creating a hybrid option can be a lifeline of participation. So um, I am grateful for the work that we've done on this ordinance and looking forward to the work that we will do to make sure that we can continue to make government open and bring in um, some sunlight. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Council Eugene. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter or add their name? Please raise your hand. Let me, let me go to Council Rall. Council Rall, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, President Flynn, and thank you, Council Block and Council Louis-Jen for your uh, work on this. Um, city government, um, as stated by my colleagues, is strongest when we are connected to the voices of our constituents. Um, in the wake of the pandemic, we implemented measures to ensure we could continue to be responsive. And in doing so, we found that, found that we could not only continue business as usual, but we can also expand access for our low-income, elderly, disabled, and working residents. Uh, I hear far, uh, from our residents far too often of the barriers of our current format and hybrid meetings are being done in our boardroom today. And as a council, we should invest in the technology that will eliminate barriers that will bring more, more voices into City Hall. Looking forward to this conversation to make sure that we can make this um, a permanent thing in City Hall. Thank you. Thank you, Council Wurl. Anyone else like to speak or add their name? Please raise your hand. Mr. Clerk, please add Council Arroyo, Council Bach, Council Fernandez Anderson, Council Flaherty, Council Murphy, Council Wurl. Please add their chair. Please add the chair. This docket 0452 will be referred to the Committee on Government Operations. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0453. Docket number 0453, Councilors Bach and Flynn offer the following. An ordinance amending the City of Boston Code Ordinance, Section 7-3, Bay Village Historic District. Thank you. The, the Chair recognizes Councilor Block. Councilor Block, you have the floor. Thank you um, so much, Mr. President, and thank you for being my co-sponsor on this. Um, as I think is well known, Bay Village is in Councillor Flynn's district, but um, is my uh, home of origin. Um, and this is actually a very small change to their historic district um, ordinance that's been already negotiated and, um, and agreed to by both the resident organization there, the Bay Village Neighborhood Association, which formally endorsed it, um, and the commissioners of the historic district. Um, there is some, when the historic district was originally set up in, uh, I think it was 1983, um, it, uh, it had just like a few carve outs. So for instance, strangely enough, like the commission can advise on the color of paint on masonry, but not on wood. Um, and so it's just created like a little bit of weirdness around some of the review dynamics. And so I think everybody felt like it's been confusing to applicants. You can have a more coherent conversation. Um, and so what this, what this legislation does is it just actually gets rid of a couple of the exclusions that are in the original <coughs> legislation um, and reduces to the ones that kind of make more sense. So like I said, it's um, been broadly uh, agreed kind of within the, the village community. Obviously, um, you know, the, I'll just, you know, for reference for folks who might be wondering where is Bay Village and why is it a historic district? Um, it's kind of sandwiched between the South End, Back Bay, Chinatown. Um, it's uh, actually 
one of the very first neighborhoods in the city that was done on fill. So the hints in the name, Bay Village, like the Back Bay, it was once water. Um, and they actually filled in Bay Village and built these houses um, mainly for an artisan community in the 1820s and 1830s, so before Back Bay, the South End, the Fenway were filled in. Um, and a lot of the folks who lived in these houses originally were the folks who were working on the bigger Back Bay mansions. Um, it's got this really long artisan history. Uh, and then um, in the, in, and actually, sort of both like federal houses, um, uh, Greek revival style and Victorian style. In the 1860s, they had to raise the entire neighborhood because of sewage issues. And so the streets and the houses were all raised up. It means that you still see in Bay Village houses that have a kind of window peeking out from the basement, but it's a full window. And it doesn't make much sense, except that it used to be the ground floor window. Um, the uh, neighborhood in the 20th century actually became the hub for Boston's movie distribution industry. Uh, and so there's still quite a lot of um, uh, like cornerstones and stuff belonging to Paramount Pictures and other uh, major uh, film distributors. And so it's had a kind of neat artisanal history on the movie side as well. Um, so like I said, small set of changes. I think I'm not asking for a suspension and passage today because want to be able to just go and say, hey, this is what it is, and so that everyone feels comfortable that it's been agreed to by the community. Um, but I did want to give the council that context. And um, and uh, yeah, and again, thank Council Councilor Flynn for being uh, my co-sponsor on it. So thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you, Council Block. Um, I was going to speak on this matter, but Council Block took all my thunder here. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, But I am proud to represent the Bay Village, and Council Block's parents are my biggest supporters there. <laughs> Um, the chair recognizes Council of Flaherty. Council of Flaherty of the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Just through the chair to the maker, I just want to make sure that the, there was some talk that the, the ring door cams were, is this part of that? So from a public safety perspective, I think that some of our historic areas of districts were sort of shunning the door cams. And That's that a stuff. beacon hell issue. Okay. Yeah. So it's obviously an important <laughs> issue. So we as a city, whether you're in a historic district or not, we have a responsibility, obviously, to keep our residents safe and or if you have the ability to have that type of security system for your home or your business, you should have the ability to do that and also to be able to participate and cooperate with our local Boston Police Department when they knock on your door and they'd like to take a, to, to view your footage in, in the event of an incident happening in front of that location or on that street. So I just want to make sure that we're not, by ordinance, carving out you know people's security systems. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Flaherty. Anyone else like to speak on this matter? or add your name, please raise your hand. Mr. Clerk, please add Councilor Arroyo, Councilor Braden, Councilor Fernandez-Anderson, Councilor Coletta, Councilor Eugene, Councilor Murphy, Councilor Worrell. Please add Councilor Laura. This docket 0453 will be referred to the Committee on Government Operations. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0454. Document number 0454, Councilors Arroyo and Coletta offer the following. An ordinance formally creating the Office of Food Justice and establishing a food recovery program in the city of Boston. Thank you. The chair recognizes Council Arroyo. Council Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. I want to begin by thanking uh, the Food Law and Policy Clinic uh, at Harvard Law uh, for their help in their research and their, their work on the legal aspects of the ordinance that's before you today. I also want to thank Councilor Coletta for her partnership in this. Uh, Massachusetts uh, Department of Environmental Protection estimates that in Massachusetts alone, about a million tons of food goes uh, to waste every year. So yearly in Massachusetts, we waste about a million uh, tons of food. And the Massachusetts State Legislature in 2014, uh, due to the environmental issues of methane, of wasted food put in a sort of recycling compost uh, requirement for food generators or food waste generators uh, in, their, in November of 2022, they enhanced it. And essentially the goal of that legislation was to get food waste out of landfills and into a compost recycling program. Uh, but nothing in Massachusetts, in fact, this would be the first in, in the country for a municipality uh, requires that that food actually go to its highest purpose, which is if you have it, rather than compost it, rather than uh, throw it into a landfill, try to find someone who can actually eat it. Uh, and I just want to get into sort of the basis of the backbone for why we did this. Uh, when I was first sworn in in 2020, uh, the pandemic hit in full force about three months in, 
And when you take a job as a district counselor, you're, you're very aware that you're going to get phone calls about potholes. You're going to get phone calls about uh, electrical grids and, and my power's out. You're going to get all these different kind of community-related, constituent service-related calls. The thing that was overwhelming was the amount of phone calls we received from people who were hungry, uh, from people who needed access to food, who needed access to food programs. And what was particularly heartbreaking during that process was having the inability to necessarily refer people to places we were referring to them to because we would get word back from those organizations, hey, we don't have enough uh, supply for this. And so we, we can't be a referral space for you in this case because we've sort of reached capacity. Uh, and to give people a sort of snapshot of what we're talking about, uh, just in 2020, uh, calls to Project Bread's food source hotline in Boston increased by 262%. Uh, the Greater Boston Food Bank saw an increase of 2,554% in distribution requests. Uh, that's very large. Uh, we are talking about, uh, the estimate is about one in five residents in Massachusetts suffer from food insecurity. Uh, so every day you are likely passing people who are suffering from food, food insecurity. And so we really wanted to get a uh, solution to this that we thought was manageable and that would work and that everybody would sort of buy into. Uh, and so we started looking at uh, food, uh, generators, food waste generators, and how we could make them play a role in this process. And we saw that New York, Washington State, New York State, and California State had created sort of a template for this to move forward. Uh, it's something that in Europe they've been doing for quite some time, which is requiring these food generators to actually take it upon themselves to create agreements with nonprofits and agencies that distribute food directly to people. So in other words, if you have something that has to be eaten within 48, 72 hours, then you can get it picked up and brought to and delivered to a food pantry or soup kitchen or somewhere where that food will not go to waste. Uh, it's an excellent uh, uh, implementation in other places. It has worked really well uh, to give people a sense of what we're talking about here. Uh, the food recycling program in Boston would be organized and, and conducted through the Office of Food Justice. Uh, so this, home, this ordinance would actually formally uh, codify the Office of Food Justice, which already exists, and it would give them uh, certain responsibilities. Uh, the folks that we're talking about having uh, to apply this ordinance to their business are what we would call tier one commercial edible food generators. They're supermarkets, grocery stores with a total facility size equal to or greater than 10,000 square feet, food service providers and food distributors, whole food, wholesale food vendors, large restaurants with 250 or more seats, or a total facility size equal or up to or greater than 5,000, uh, hotels with on-site food facility with 100 or more beds, large venues and large events, colleges or universities, local or state agencies with large cafeterias, and any public or private school, grades kindergarten, kindergarten through 12, that do on-site food facilities and generate excess food waste. And the way that we would seek to enforce this, uh, and first and foremost, uh, one of the things that was really successful in other locations was a, a lead-in time to having this process uh, become enforceable. And so this wouldn't lead to enforcement until 2026. So even though this would start the program and start the pipelines and start getting everything sort of set up, nobody would be subject to enforcement until 2026. Uh, on top of that, uh, if you for some reason were unable to comply with this ordinance because it would be an undue economic hardship on your business, we will have an undue economic hardship waiver uh, and so that you will be able to uh, not have this apply to you, and you can get that re-upped as often and as, and as many times as you need that re-upped. It would last a year uh, throughout the course of your business if this would be an undue economic hardship for you. Uh, what this would do, and the way we would enforce this, because these are sort of common questions, uh, you know, we're not going to be doing inspections on every restaurant, hotel, uh, supermarket. The way that this is enforced in other states that I think we can do here is it requires those tier one operators to enter into agreements with not-for-profits that donate food, that provide food. We are then able to monitor which of these tier one operators have not entered into these agreements. Simply just show us this contract and then we'll know that you are in compliance. Uh, and then those operators are supposed to report to the city just how much uh, food they are getting and generating from these tier one operators and, and providing. And I want to just give uh, a shout out to organizations that do this work. Uh, Love and Spoonfuls, 
as the largest in New England, and they pick food up and deliver it directly to doors. Uh, food Link Mass uh, and the Greater Boston Food Bank are the kinds of organizations we're talking about here. The other thing I just want to point out, some people have raised this uh, concern about liability uh, for organizations and opening them up to liability. Uh, there's a federal law, uh, which is called the Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Food Donation Act, which shields food donors from criminal and civil liability. But Massachusetts actually built upon that in 2014 and protect eligible food donors that donate food uh, to recovery organizations that distribute apparently wholesome food to individuals. And so this wouldn't open up businesses or, or supermarkets or anyone to any undue legal uh, complications. This would simply be a way for us to ensure that edible, wholesome food that otherwise could be eaten is actually getting to families that need that food rather than going to a landfill or into a composting process. Um, I'm incredibly excited to get this started. Uh, we would be a first in the country to pilot this and to do this correctly at a municipal level. Uh, there are three states, as I mentioned, in the United States that are starting this out. All of those laws uh, essentially went into effect in 2022 or there's abouts, and so it's a relatively new idea. But I do believe that we have the capacity and the ability to have our, our businesses and our um, frontline stakeholders buy into this process. And uh, the feedback so far has been really great. So I'm really excited about providing meals to people who need them. Thank you. Thank you, Council Arroyo. The chair recognizes Council Coletta. Council Coletta, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. And I do just want to thank the lead sponsor, Council Arroyo, on this. Um, who has done uh, incredible work working in partnership with the Harvard Law School uh, Food Law and Policy Clinic. Boston could be a model municipality, and uh, we would be the first to adopt this sort of food recovery program, which would require some of these larger grocery stores, restaurants, and hotels to donate underscore safe to consume leftover food. Um, this ordinance also formally establishes the Office of Food Justice, which we all know is already assisting some of our wonderful nonprofits on the ground and are already feeding our most um, vulnerable. Uh, hunger is silent, uh, but a stigmatized issue. We uh, largely know somebody or, or probably know somebody who is going hungry right now. This is our, our family, our friends, and our neighbors. Um, according to Project Bread, food insecurity in Massachusetts doubled during the pandemic, increasing from 8% to almost 20%. I have personally seen hundreds of folks lining the corners uh, in the streets of East Boston, at the East Boston Soup Kitchen, at Harvest on the Vine, in Charlestown, waiting to get their meals uh, for the week through groceries. And so their organization's already doing an incredible work, and I think the city of Boston can go above and beyond through this program to, uh, to provide food for our most vulnerable. And the goal at the end of the day is to provide whole nutritious food um, for, re for those residents. And so as mentioned, this order would compel first larger and then smaller food generators to compile their edible leftovers. I think the timeline that we have uh, laid out is reasonable. Obviously, there's gonna be more conversations to be had, but we welcome folks to the table to make this the best possible program that we that we can in order to feed some of our most vulnerable here in the city of Boston. So again, thank you to uh, the lead code sponsor and uh, partners like Eleven Spoonfuls who have already helped us out with this proposal. And I do look forward to uh, the conversations ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Council Clutter. Is anyone else looking to speak on this matter? The chair recognizes Councilor Braden. Councilor Braden, you have the floor. I want to thank my colleagues, uh, Councillor Royo and Councillor Corletta, for bringing this initiative forward, and all those who've worked on, on, on formulating this, this effort. Um, I, I know from my experience uh, volunteering at the food pantry in, in Alston Brighton that loving spoonfuls in the Greater Boston Food Pantry, uh, Food Bank, and all of those folks who are working on food rescue, um, there's so much really good edible food being thrown in the trash and in the, in, the, in the landfill when there's so many thousands and thousands of folks in our community and across the Commonwealth who, who go to bed hungry at night. So I really applaud this. I think Boston should be a leader in this space and um, please add my name. Thank you. Thank you, Council Brady. And the chair recognizes Council Alara. Council Alara, you have Thank the you, floor. President Flynn. And I just want to thank the sponsors of this ordinance for putting this on the floor. I think that this is an issue that folks have been having a conversation about, not just in the city, but all across the country for an incredible amount of time. I have been aware of this issue, unfortunately, since I was a very young girl. Um, my, my mother used to clean at the Finagle Bagel in Chestnut Hill, if anybody's ever been over there. And she used to always bring home at the end of the day a bag of the leftover bagels 
and used to tell me that she could get in trouble for bringing them home. And so I remember that that's the first time that I became aware of the fact that you cannot, <laughs> that you're not allowed to give food that other people would eat away um, to people who would benefit from it. And so I think that this is incredibly overdue. I'm excited to move uh, this work forward uh, and I would like to sign my name on, please. Thank you, Council Lara. The chair recognizes Council of Flaherty. Council of Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, 20 years ago, I actually sat and served with uh, Council Ricardo Arroyo's dad, Council Felix Arroyo, and he actually proposed um, vegetable oil and grease as part of a biofuel for uh, diesel engines, which at that time I thought was he was way ahead of his time. Uh, but I have to think that this is, uh, I have to say this is something that uh, has, this, its time has come, and all of us have gone into an establishment later in the evening on the way home and saw and have seen a whole rack or tray of food uh, right before closing. And you naturally just ask, hey, what are you going to do with that? And they say, well, we, there's nothing we can do with it. We have to throw it away. It's, it could be pizzas. It could be bakery items. It's, you name it, as Councilor um, Braden had just mentioned, it's, it's good and it's uh, edible food that unfortunately goes right in. So uh, this is an idea that its time has come, not only here in Boston, but uh, across the state and across the country. Please add my name. Look forward to an expedited hearing and let's try to get a pilot program at least or a, a model on the books so that uh, our local establishments, who by the way it pains them to have to do this too, uh, when you're literally dumping a tray of whatever, chicken palm, eggplant, pizza, whatever it is, is going right in the trash. It just sends a, a horrendous message to those that uh, are food insecure and or to our local food pantries. We all know, I'm not gonna out anyone, Council President, but we know establishments in our own neighborhood that don't play by these rules. They actually deliver food uh, to some of our more vulnerable residents. They work with our halfway houses, our treatment houses, uh, kind of off the radar, but uh, in, in, in lieu of them throwing their food away, oftentimes they'll call our office, they'll go to the fire station, they'll go to the police station. So again, there's that effort is underway, not just in our neighborhood, but across uh, the city. Wouldn't it be great to have that codified? Wouldn't it be great to have a pilot program that we could model? So again, uh, an idea I believe that's, uh, that's time has come and look forward to uh, participating. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Flaherty. The Chair recognizes Council Fernandez Anderson. Council Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to the lead, co -spon the lead sponsors and the co-sponsors on this. Um, I think it's exceptionally um, important and high time for us to do this, but I also would like to add that we um, ask for the program to also include recipes to everything that's going to be given away. So when you're collecting, I used to collect from Panera um, as a nonprofit to give away in like different ways um, and programs. And I would have to ask them like each recipe for everything that they were baking or giving away. Um, especially if we're going to include Cheesecake Factory, I'm going to need all of their recipes, every <laughs> single one. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah, allergies, allergies. <laughs> Thank you, Council Fernandez Anderson. Anyone else looking to speak or add their name? Mr. Clerk, please add Councilor Baker, Councilor Buck, Councilor Braden, Council Flaherty, Council Louis Jean, Councilor Murphy, Councilor Worrell. Sorry. Please. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, please have the chair. This docket 0454 will be referred to the Committee on Government Operations. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0455, please. Docket number 0455, Councilor Flynn offered the following. An ordinance amending the City of Boston Code relating to the study and report on the trafficking of illegal firearms. The chair recognizes Councillor Flynn. Councillor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Councillor Braden. Councillor Braden, may I add Councillor Worrell as an original co-sponsor? Uh, seeing no objection um, or hearing no objection, Councillor Worrell is added. Thank you, Councillor Braden. Um, this is an ordinance um, that would eventually require Boston Police Department to conduct a study, an annual study, a report with data on the flow of firearms in review of ways that illegal firearms are being transported, transported into our city. As you know, gun violence is a leading cause of death and injuries in our country. 
in our city has certainly experienced gun violence. Gun trafficking, illegal flow of firearms, is a major contributor, obviously, to gun violence. And with Boston Police recovering more than 900 firearms in 2022. In 2021, of the firearms recovered at scenes that were traced using the National Integrated Ballistic Information, only 10% were purchased in Massachusetts, while the rest were brought into our state from 18 other states. So most of the firearms at crime scenes are outside of Massachusetts. But what this ordinance would do, it would be a comprehensive study in review of the flow of firearms into the city of Boston. It would help law enforcement and policymakers better understand the impact of illegal gun trafficking. And this data would help craft strategies to reduce gun violence in our city and hopefully across the state as well. This ordinance would require the Boston Police Department to, to disclose in an annual report a number of details for each firearm seized or surrendered in the city and obtained by the Boston Police Department, as well as a review of the ways firearms are illegally transported into Boston. This is a, this is a similar ordinance that passed in New York City last year. I hope that this ordinance can shed a light on illegal firearm trafficking that's impacting our city. Thank you, Councilor Braden. Thank you, uh, Councillor Flynn. Um, is anyone else looking to speak on this matter? Councillor Worrell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you to President Flynn for including me in this work and uh, bringing this before us. Um, and as we work to address gun violence throughout our city, it is critical that we are gathering data to best understand the issues we face. Uh, Massachusetts has strong gun laws. Uh, but as we heard from um, President Flynn, is majority of those guns that are coming into Massachusetts are not from our state. And in order to address this, uh, we will need to build out our data collection and, al and analysis tools to ensure that silos are broken down. Uh, we must also work to address ghost guns, uh, which is now starting to pop up, and other weapons that's, that are designed to be less traceable. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Um, thank you for including me. Um, Councillor Lara, you have the floor. Thank you, Councillor Braden, and thank you to Councillor Flynn and Councillor Worrell for putting this incredibly important issue on the floor. When I was a street worker, I worked with an organization called Citizens for Safety on a program that they had called Operation Lipstick. And Nancy Robinson and the women who work for Operation Lipstick and Citizens for Safety have for a long time been ringing the alarm about trafficking, specifically straw purchases that oftentimes are made by partners or family members of the folks who are trafficking guns into the city of Boston. This program is led by women who have been not only directly impacted <coughs> by gun violence, but have themselves uh, been involved in straw purchases. And so for me, that was an incredibly innovative program that was really getting at the heart of the issue, which is how guns are getting into the city and really continuing to ask that question that as we make sure that we're targeting the root causes, making sure that we're supporting young people who are involved or impacted by this, that we're also talking about how these guns are getting into our community because our young people are typically not the ones that are bringing them in. And so I'm incredibly heartened by this initiative. Uh, and please consider me a partner in anything that you might need to get this done and add my name. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else wish to add their, their name? Councillor Arroyo, Councillor Baker, Councillor Bach. Councillor uh, Coletta, Councillor Fernandez Anderson, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Lara, Councillor Louis Jean, Councillor Murphy, Councillor, and please add my name. Docket 0455 will be referred to the Committee on Government Operations. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Braden. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 0456, please? Docket number 0456, Councillor, Councillors Fernandez, Anderson, and Lujan offer the following. Order for a hearing to restrict upfront rental costs for tenants. Thank you. 
The chair recognizes Councillor <coughs> Fernandez Anderson. Councillor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'd like to suspend the rules and add Councillor Lauder as a third co sponsor. Seeing and, hear no, seeing and hearing no objection, Councillor Lara is added. The chair recognizes Councillor Fernandez Anderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. As we know, Boston is one of the most expensive cities to rent um, or own property. Boston is the only other city other than New York City which is in the process of um, banning um, these uh, with broker's fees for tenants and prices that have gone up significantly in the past couple of years, which is why the conversation is prevalent now. Um, this um, has been an ongoing issue for some time now, and our residents, particularly black and brown residents of Boston, are facing anti -displ facing um, displacement and eviction. Many have already been displaced due to rising rental fees um, and uh, restricting the up upfront cost for serve that can serve as a temporary solution before we permanently alleviate the issue of up rental cost and um, upfront rate rental cost and broker's fees. Boston should be leading by example in caring for our residents, especially considering our overwhelming homelessness crisis. We have lost about 10,000 black residents in the last um, two uh, decades because of the increasing inaccessibility of housing in our city. Um, some of which are owned by private corporations and only play a larger role in a systemically racist and disproportionately displacement and disenfranchisement community supporting by the city. Um, so I'm, I'm asking for us to um, basically hold a hearing and have a conversation about the um, up, upfront rental costs and take um, the unbearable weight of decades old practices off the tenants of Boston. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Fernandez Anderson. The chair, chair recognizes Council Louis Jean. Council Louis Jean, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Um, I am incredibly um, excited to work on this. My office, one of the earliest calls that we got was from con a constituent who was um, saying that they couldn't take an apartment because of how expensive the upfront costs are. Uh, their uh, folks are often asked for first months, last months, uh, security deposit. Um, and if they have to pay a broker's fee, if your rent is $2,000, you're often asked to pay upwards of $8,000 just as an upfront cost. And at that point, um, a lot of our residents can't afford to live in this city. So my office has been doing research, and, 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 that's, and there's a groundbreaking study in 2020 that called Qualified Renters Need Not Apply that showed that race and class played a major role in how one is treated when seeking housing. And not only that, the same study demonstrated that real estate brokers play an outsized role in discrimination in the rental housing market. Um, of the 200 testers in the study, 182 had contact, exclusive, uh, had contact exclusively with real estate brokers. Um, and we know that not all real estate brokers are bad. They, we have some that are great and some even on the council, but we know that passing on these fees to our tenants can be really big barriers. Um, as a second most expensive city to rent, we really need to um, get at that. I know in Councilor Braden's district, for example, we, we have talked about how broker's fees often are a really big barrier to uh, uh, residents in your district, especially to our young people, especially to our artists, especially to black and brown folks. So um, I'm excited to continue this conversation. It's not new for the city of Boston, actually. Former Mayor Walsh, former Secretary Walsh, um, actually commissioned a study and, and a group to really look at brokers' fees and, and look at into eliminating them. This is continuing that work. Um, and so I'm happy to be doing that work um, and to really you know, be responding to the constituents who ask us to look into this all the time and to reduce the barriers to housing. So thank you and I look forward to the work. Thank you, Council louis -Jean. The chair recognizes Council Lara. Council Lara, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn, and thank you to Councilor Fernandez Anderson and Councilor louis -Jean for including me uh, in this hearing order. I want to join the, the chorus of stories in terms of folks really having trouble or calling our offices, really struggling to pay the upfront fees. Just a week ago when we announced that we were going to be working on the hearing for the Renters Bill of Rights, a constituent sent us a message on Instagram letting us know that their landlord was asking them to pay a lease renewal fee. <laughs> just to renew the lease one time and adding a fee on top of them. And they were unsure 
if it was legal. And so we had to do the groundwork and get a lawyer to send them a letter that they could send to their landlord to let them know ultimately that they couldn't charge that kind of fee. And so what we're seeing is that not only just upfront costs, but frivolous charges um, for renters are just increasing and making it impossible for people to be able to secure a rental apartment. Right now, the housing crisis is really requiring that we implement every possible intervention so that we can lower these costs and stabilize tenant. And upfront fees for renters have always been prohibitive uh, just because of the amount. And especially, they're especially prohibited for poor and working class people who are not only more prone to displacement, but also have higher rates of, um, of eviction. I think that there are limits to what landlords can consider move, move in cost, but most tenants don't know what it is what is or isn't allowable, which is underscoring for me again the need for a renter's bill of rights in the city of Boston. Uh, we have programs that, refer, that support first-time home buyers in meeting their closing costs or their down payments, but we don't have as much support for existing for renters to pay for their upfront cost here in the city or anywhere in the country, really. Uh, so I'm excited to move this conversation forward with the co-sponsors, and I look forward to implementing more protections for renters in the city of Boston. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lara. The chair recognizes Council Buck. Council Buck, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Mr. President, and I'll be brief. I, I wanted to thank um, Council Francis Anderson for filing this, um, and definitely please add my name. The one additional dimension that I wanted to add is, you know, as folks know, we have um, a law against source of income discrimination here in Massachusetts, meaning that you can't prevent somebody from renting because they would use a voucher. Um, but the reality is that these upfront costs are often one of the ways in which people informally discriminate against voucher holders. Um, it's actually something that the Boston Housing Authority spent quite a lot of energy on and has sort of like tried to create some programs so that it can kind of help get its renters into these situations. Um, but it's a real barrier and uh, you know, there are plenty of ways, even even if you say, hey, it, like the landlord needs to be able to hold a security deposit, you can prorate the way that that's going to be paid. Like there are ways to like to deal with that without creating a, what Councilor Lee Jen referred to, this kind of like upfront burden of, you know, $8,000, maybe sometimes $10,000, because um, it just, it really does serve as another source of informal source of income discrimination in the state. So I just wanted to, um, add my sense that it's it's long past time for a change on that front. Thank you. Thank you, Council Bach. The Chair recognizes Councilor Braden. Councilor Braden, you have the floor. Thank you. I want to thank um, Councilor Fernandez Anderson for bringing this forward. It's very, very important. And, um, and Councilor Louis Jean, uh, the, I, I'm Councilor Bach has stolen my thunder again. Um, <laughs> the, the, the barriers that, to folks who have, have vouchers and, and the additional uh, cost of um, uh, of these extra fees, uh, have, I've heard from folks that this is a, a significant barrier to their participation in getting, getting even being, to even be considered for a, a rental apartment if, if their uh, source of income is, uh, or the way to pay is, is a voucher. Um, the other, I, I've had a conversation with a, 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 um, a constituent recently who was relocating back to Boston from DC um, she had a friend uh, look at the go to look at the apartment. The the broker never appeared. She never got to see the apartment ahead of time. She did, you know. She was, and then at the end of it, she was charged a month's rent for this broker's services that never happened. So I think there's a, there's as Councillor Louis Jean said, there's some excellent brokers. Uh, there's some good practice, but there are also uh, some practices that are. Blatant, blatantly um, predatory uh, and take advantage of a situation. And I think it's long past time that we try and amend it. Thank you. Thank you, Council Braden. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter or add your name? Please raise your hand. Mr. Crook, please add Council Arroyo, Council Braden, Council Coletta, Council Bach, Council Coletta, Council Murphy, Council Rell. This docket 0456 will be referred to the Committee on Housing and Community Development. Mr. Quirk, we're on to docket 0457, please. Docket number 0457, Councilors Arroyo and Fernandez Anderson offer the following. Order for a hearing to discuss Boston Public Schools' lack of religious and dietary requirements for Jewish, Muslim, and plant-based students. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Council Arroyo. Council Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, President Flynn. This was an issue, uh, the lack of 
uh, kosher, halal, or plant-based meals in Boston Public Schools was actually an issue brought to me by some parents uh, who were seeking those meals for their children in BPS, uh, which was surprising to me because I was a public defender before I did this work in our incarceration, uh, our, our House of Corrections are required by law to provide these meals uh, because we understand the importance of people's religious accommodations, but Boston Public Schools do not provide these meals to our students. Uh, and so we are seeking a hearing to have a conversation about how we can go about ensuring that halal, kosher, and plant-based meals are made available to children in BPS who have those specific dietary restrictions. Um, it's important that we teach the whole child, and part of teaching a child or teaching anyone is making sure that they are fed. Uh, and so we want to make sure that we are doing everything we can as a city to provide for those families. Um, I was actually surprised. I, you could put this one in the, I didn't know we didn't do that category because this seems very much like something that should have already been happening. Uh, I know that uh, Michelle Wu, Mayor Michelle Wu, uh, announced, I believe it was last year, a new contract with City Fresh Foods. Uh, and so I think that that is a step in the right direction. I'd like to have a hearing to have a conversation about how we go about ensuring that the families who this applies to, uh, which are probably several thousand, that they are receiving the uh, what they need on a day-to-day -day basis to, to meet their dietary needs. Uh, and so this is one of those things where I thought we were already doing it. We're not, uh, and I'm seeking to make sure that we do. Uh, New York is state legislature has started work on doing the exact same thing in New York, uh, but we're overdue on this. I'm grateful and appreciative of the parents who brought this to my attention, and I look forward to having this hearing. Uh, and I also want to thank Tanya Fernandez Anderson, Councilor Anderson, for her partnership on this. Thank you. Thank you, Council Royal. The chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Mr. President, and thank you to the original co I mean, original sponsor, Council Royal, for um, part uh, for adding me um, as a partner in this uh, conversation. Um, I think that. We're all we all we're all talking about inclusivity, but I think that you know we're often um, not very intentional in terms of how what or what that looks like, um, and we are what we eat, right? So in religious practices, at least for me as a Muslim woman, what we eat is based on um, our state of mind, our health, and basically our way of life, and even how we eat or where we eat or with what we eat is a thing. So um, I look forward to the conversation without going any further about what halal means or the difference between kosher or halal or vegan and vegetarian, and pescatarian. Um, there are so many um, diverse uh, ways of uh, practicing your way of life and um, I'm very happy to be a part of this conversation and looking forward to hopefully implementing some change in BPS. Thank you. Thank you, Council Fernandez Anderson. The chair recognizes Councilor Braden. Councilor Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you again to the makers. Um, I, I think, and I've had some conversations. It's not in the in the in the Boston public school space, but more uh, in relation to uh, our Jewish community uh, in in Austin, Brighton, thinking about um, um, kosher meals for school schools generally, um, including Boston public schools. But um, one issue that seemed to have come up is that in terms of supply uh, suppliers that there has to be sort of a critical mass to make it an, a, an economically um, favorable situation. So I think, you know, by, by uh, working together with, uh, with schools that are in the independent sector, in the private sector, the, the, uh, we may be able to get to that critical mass so that it actually supports uh, small businesses to, to be direct suppliers. I think that's one of the issues with regard to uh, finding vendors to uh, for Boston Public Schools. Maybe that the, that they haven't been able to identify suppliers. So I'm I'm hopeful that we could explore that and uh, see if we can find a solution. Thank you. Please add my name. Thank you, Council Braden. The chair recognizes Council Lara. Council Lara, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. I just want to rise as a possible beneficiary of <laughs> this policy. Um, as someone who is vegan and is trying to transition my kid, who is mostly vegan, sans 
a chicken nugget here and there. So if any parents are watching and they have a good vegan chicken nugget that their kid will eat, please send me recommendations. Um, in any case, I typically have to wake up earlier in the morning to prepare Zaire's lunch to go to school because there are not plant-based uh, food options for him. So as he gets older, I would really love, it would be really nice for him to be able to eat with his classmates in the cafeteria. And I think that this is um, not only respectful of people's religious practices, but of people's decisions, whether it be environment-based or um, focused on care and love for animals that they have food that they can eat. So please add my name. And I would love to have more conversations around possible vendors for plant-based food uh, at Boston Public Schools because I know a lot of incredible restaurants, not only in the city, but in the district who I think would be willing and able to provide that service. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lara. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter or add your name? Please raise your hand. Mr. Clerk, please add Councilor Bach, Councilor Braden, Councilor Coletta, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Lara, Councilor Eugene, Councilor Murphy, Council Worrell, please add the chair. This docket 0457 will be referred to the Committee on Education. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0458, please. Docket number 0458, Councilor Worrell offered the following. Order for a hearing to assess expanded hospital and community-centric violence prevention and intervention. Thank you. The chair recognizes Council Worrell. Council Worrell, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, President Flynn. And I'd like to suspend Route 12 and add <coughs> Councilor Anderson and Councilor Murphy. Hearing no objection, both Councilor Anderson and Councilor Murphy are added. The chair recognizes Council Worrell. Um, Boston is home to world-class institutions and community groups that are working to address violence throughout our city. Uh, these folks are called upon by cities across the globe to address their issues, yet are frequently neglected in their own city. These groups provide invaluable services that have kept hundreds of Bostonians alive, have helped to repair communities, and work to heal individual traumas and wounds. It is time that our city government steps up and supports these groups as they have supported us. The issues uh, that feed violence are complex as their solutions. Part of the complexity that we must work through is a question of coordination and collaboration. And facing similar challenges, uh, the city of Hartford has worked to build a comprehensive intervention effort, bringing together hospitals and community partners. The aim to work side by side to make sure we seize that moment of opportunity when someone becomes a victim of violence or gun violence to connect them to resources and support services that will last long after the physical wounds have healed. Uh, the city of Boston can learn from our neighbors, and it is time that we, we look at formalizing collaborative structures, ensuring coordination, and making sure that organizations doing the work have the resources they need to do so. Uh, Boston is an asset rich. Uh, it's time to us to build these resources and enable them to be effective. Um, and this is just a continuation on the gun violence and violence work that our office is doing, and we feel like formalizing um, all the work that all hospitals are doing and all community partners are doing uh, here in the city of Boston uh, can reap a lot of benefits when it comes to combating violence intervention and prevention uh, solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Council Worrell. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? The chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. President. Thank you to the lead sponsor um, on this uh, hearing order. I look forward to the conversations. I think this is a wonderful opportunity to really talk about what does intervention and prevention looks like and also holding private institutions and, of course, nonprofits as such as hospitals um, and universities accountable for uh, the communities that are, they're thriving from. Um, I think there are already some services in our communities that are considerable um, interventive programs, but I think obviously you felt that they could do more or that we could uh, create this sort of ecosystem of services, um, and I really appreciate that. I also wanted to um, bring to light that uh, my office has been working with um, Black Male Advancement, and I know that um, I look forward to continuing to partner with you in terms of mentorship programs or sponsorship programs that private institutions can support uh, black and brown boys in our communities to continue to invest in their lives in a preventative way. Um, thank you so much for thinking, being so such a forward thinker on this, and I look forward to the work. 
Thank you, Councilor Fernandez Anderson. The chair recognizes Councilor Murphy. Councilor Murphy, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn, and thank you, Councilor Worrell, for including me. When I read through your hearing order on Monday in the whereas clause that said intervening in disrupting and ending cycles of violence requires collaborative, coordinated, community-based action, when I call to say I absolutely agree with you. And as we know, our community centers are welcoming places where many of our immigrants and underserved communities access because of their language and cultural um, welcomeness. Also, um, places expanded violence prevention and intervention programs. If we're putting in them in those spaces where community members feel safe to go and those closest to the violence are accessing these spaces <coughs> the most, I think it's a great idea. So I'm glad for this hearing order and look forward to the conversation. So thank you. Thank you, Council Murphy. Anyone else looking to speak on this matter or add your name? Mr. Clark, please add Councilor, Councilor Royal, Councilor Baker, Councilor Bach, Councilor Coletta, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Braden, Councilor Lara, Councilor Luijan. Please add the chair. This docket 0458. This docket 458 will be referred to the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0459. Docket number 0459, Councilor Arroyo for the following. Order for a hearing to discuss challenges Latino-owned businesses and entrepreneurs face when accessing government and corporate contracts. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Councilor Arroyo. Councilor Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, this is a hearing order asking us to discuss the challenges Latino-owned businesses uh, and entrepreneurs are facing uh, with accessing government and corporate uh, contracts here in the city of Boston. Uh, we know that the 2020 disparity study uh, that took the numbers from 2014 to 2019 uh, showed that out of 2.1 billion contracts that the city awarded, only 18.2 million or 0.8% of those contracts were awarded to Latino-owned businesses. Uh, and there was a recent study uh, that uh, was publicized, I believe, uh, two, I almost want to say three, four days ago uh, by either WGBR, GBH or WBUR uh, discussing specifically uh, that nationally this is a trend and that it, uh, and what I would sort of remind folks uh, who are listening to this and say, well, maybe they're just not eligible. What, what generally is happening uh, is that they're not being told uh, in the response to their de the declining of giving them these contracts. They're not being told how to become competitive for these contracts or how and in what ways they can make their applications better. And generally speaking, when you see a disparity of this size where 0.8% of contracts are being awarded to Latino-owned businesses, but in Massachusetts, their payroll uh, has actually doubled and is, is something that is actually a growing class of entrepreneurship here in the state. Uh, it's usually a systemic issue that is keeping us from getting to that to that solution and is creating that inequity. Uh, and so the goal of this hearing is simply to figure out what we are doing to help them access government contracts and create competitive bids uh, or bids that we are accepting for government contracts uh, and then making sure that we are creating best practices which may go beyond just the Latino businesses but all businesses and making sure that we are telling them, you know, if you applied for a contract, this is why we did not select you. These are the ways in which you can uh, present better or perform better uh, when you are asking for these contracts. I think we should have a feedback system so that we are creating a competitive market for these contracts uh, and that those contracts are then getting to uh, all people, frankly, it, with equal access and opportunity uh, and that we are addressing gaps like this. So I look forward to holding that hearing. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilor Royal. The Chair recognizes Councilor Coletta. Councilor Coletta, you have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, President Flynn. I just want to thank the Maker, uh, Councilor Royal, for his leadership on this. That st statistic is jarring, and it's completely unacceptable. It's the first time that I've seen it. Um, and so I really appreciate the approach uh, with this hearing order. I had the pleasure of attending a Veronica Robles entrepreneurship um, showcase in East Boston just recently and seeing um, some of the faces of these young adults, I'm not gonna call them kids, they were young adults, they were so excited to get into the field and sector of entrepreneurship. And so if we could work with community partners like Veronica doing incredible work um, in, in the community, um, and just letting folks know that this is an option, that government contracts are an option, I think that that's 
um, another avenue that, that we can explore, but I just wanted to get up and uh, express my gratitude and thank the maker for bringing this to the forefront of public discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Clutter. Is anyone else looking to speak on this matter? The Chair recognizes Councillor Bach. Councillor Bach, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, um, and please also add my name. Um, I think that there's a huge opportunity here. I was just chatting with um, a major hospital system in my district, and you know, I think in a lot of ways the next step from our disparity study is recognizing that a lot of the types of things that keep contractors from, like diverse contractors from successfully competing for a lot of the things that City of Boston needs, they, it's the same for all of our large corporations. And so I think that like, you know, and, and in fact, many of the disparity studies studied sectors are exactly the same. And so I think really challenging, you know, we're obviously in a lot of institutional master planning processes in my district. Um, with our largest buyers, our, our eds and meds. Um, you know, I think challenging those folks to kind of come along on this journey that the city of Boston is also on so that it's not, it's not that we're just telling them to do it, it's actually something that we are also working on, but saying like, hey, if, if everybody is trying to, um, you know, source more diverse food contractors or other contract, like let's do that together. Um, so I just wanted to voice that that's something that has been coming up in my conversations with these large entities in my district and I think there's like a real opportunity here for a for a synergy between the city um, and those sectors as well. Thank you Mr. President. Thank you Council Buck. Would anyone like to add their name please raise your hand. Mr. Quirk please add Councilor Buck, Councilor Braden, Councilor Coletta, Councilor Fernandez Anderson, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Laura, Councilor Eugene, Councilor Murphy. Please add the chair, Councilor Worrell as well. Um, this docket 0459 will be referred to the Committee on Small Business and Professional Licensure. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0460. Docket number 0460, Councilor Fernandez Anderson offered the following. Resolution to explore a need for a senior recreational center in Roxbury. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, I, my office has been partnering with um, several institutions, but in particular with Northeastern to do an anti-displacement project. And in that project, we began with a year ago with asset mapping, sort of a strength-based approach to look at what are the deficits and, of course, assets in Roxbury. Um, D7 as a whole, but we tried to focus on neighborhood by neighborhood. So in Roxbury, we realized that it's, it's a place where um, we have a wealth of resources and of course um, historic landmarks and beautiful um, uh, culture, arts and culture. Um, however, we have not properly taken care of our seniors. This resolution in particular is asking um, you, my colleagues today, to um, support me in at least looking at a study to implement or to develop a center, a holistic center, that we can actually begin to take care of our seniors. Um, yes, we have some nursing homes or we have senior homes, but we do not have uh, actual holistic um, recreational center where seniors can go and work out and play and do whatever exercises and uh, functions that they want. They'd have to go to different locations to get each uh, component. And we, we think that seniors, of course, in Roxbury deserve more. Um, if there is a place where it's uh, more focus on again holistic health and a place specifically for seniors that where they can also bring their families or men, maybe mentor a young person um, in District 7 or otherwise in Boston um, it would be a wonderful thing. So today I'm asking that um, we uh, suspend the rules and, pa and pass this resolution again to um, look into uh, a study that would uh, create a recreational holistic um, center for seniors in Roxbury. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Would anyone like to speak on this matter or add their name, please raise your hand. Mr. Clerk, please add Councilor Royal, Councilor Baker, Councilor Bach, Councilor Braden, Councilor Coletta, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Lara, Councilor Eugene, Councilor Murphy, Councilor Raul, please add the chair. Councilor Fernandez Anderson seeks suspension of the rules and adoption of 0460, all those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it, the docket has been adopted. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0461. Docket number 0461. Councilor Fernandez. 
Councilors Fernandez Sanz and Worrell offer the following. Resolution honoring the legacy of MLK and Mrs. King through the establishment of King's Heritage Trail. Mr. Clerk, before we take this docket, may we go back to 0460, 0460 and do a roll call vote, please? Roll call vote on docket number 0460. Councilor Arroyo. Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker. Aye. Councilor Baker, aye. Councilor Bach. Aye. Councilor Bach, aye. Councilor Braden. Aye. Councilor Braden, aye. Councilor Coletta. Yes. Councilor Coletta, yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, yes. Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn. Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Lara. Council Lara, yes. Council Lu Yes. Council Lu yes. Council Mejia. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Murphy, yes. And Council Worrell. Yes. Council Worrell. Docket number 0460 has received 12 votes in the affirmative. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. This docket has been adopted. Mr. Clerk, can we continue on docket 0461, please? Docket 0461, Councilor Fernandez Anderson and Councilor Worrell offer the following. Resolution honoring the legacy of MLK and Mrs. King through the establishment of King's Heritage Trail. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. The Chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to spend the rules and add Councilor Lujan. Hearing no objection, Councilor Louis Jean is added. The Chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Thank you, Mr. President. Looking at the history of Boston, we have seen many notable historical figures come and go. Uh, from what um, W.E.B. Du Bois to Bill Russell from Melnia cast to Malcolm X, we have been a city that has benefited <coughs> tremendously from the contributions of African Americans despite the history of our city. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. and his wife Coretta Scott King share a beautiful, though not perfect, love story that started here in Boston. Dr. King came to Boston in 1951 to attend Boston University's grad school, expecting to just be educated. Not one could have prepared him for what he would learn to an experience outside the classroom in the streets of our city. Thanks to the diligence of Clennon L. King, we have a list of 20 addresses where the Kings share their story and experience Boston. We know that Dr. King was a regular at the Western Lunchbox on 417 Mass Ave and met Mrs. King at New England Conservatory. He extended 12 Baptist Church on 680 Shaman Ave, where he became an assistant minister. Mrs. King herself attended New England Conservatory studying opera. She worked on the Urban League of Greater Boston on tw uh, 22 Whittier Street. The couple's first home together was on 396 Northampton Street. Dr. King returned to Boston and led March, a march of 22,000 people from Roxbury to the Boston Commons where the Embrace Sculpture is erected. And he then said the words, now is the time to make real the promise of democracy. Now is the time to make brotherhood. The King's legacy and stories deserve to be remembered and honored through the establishment of King's Heritage Trail where plaques of their footprints will be enshrined at each address. Mr. Um, President, today um, I'd like to suspend and pass uh, this resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Council uh, Fernandez Anderson. Would anyone else like to speak in this matter? The chair recognizes Councilor Brian Worrell. Council Worrell, you have the floor. Um, thank you, Council President Flynn, and thank you for uh, Council Anderson for including me in this, on this work. Um, as you heard from uh, Councilor Anderson, as Boston is famous for its history, uh, we have memorials, markers, trails, and tributes scattered throughout the downtown neighborhoods commem commemorating turning points in American history. Uh, Boston also has a long been home to black activism, civil rights le leadership, and revolutions and race, race relations. Uh, sadly, this history is often unknown, even by our own resident. And emphasizing this history will help build community pride 
or help teach our children that Boston's rich history is not simply that of segregation and disinvestment, but one of resilience and resistance. And in doing so, we will help to open neighborhoods to residents and tourists alike, supporting black-owned businesses throughout the city. Thank you. Thank you, Council Worrell. The Chair recognizes Council Louis Jen. Council Louis Jen, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Council Fernand Anderson. I am so excited by this resolution. Um, I was a tour guide as my first job um, when I was 14, giving uh, walking tours of Lower Roxbury and the South End, you know, of, with, through my town, the brainchild of Dr. Uh, Carolyn Crockett, um, advised by the great Mel King. And so one of the stops on the tour is MLK's home on Mass Avenue, and it is one of the ways that we start the tour. Although I gave this tour when I was younger, I can, st I, I can still give the tour. I gave the tour two years ago. Um, and um, it, it's just really great that we can tell the story of Dr. King and Coretta, um, of their love story here. Um, and, how, and I also love how that's been folded into the embrace. Uh, Mass Design Group, the architecture firm behind the embrace, was actually led and started, uh, which, which was uh, the black, black architect behind the embrace, they actually have a mapping out of all of these significant places. So I think there's going to be a really great partnership in building out what this trail looks like. Um, as Councilor Worrell stated, there's so much rich black history in this city. And we have so many oral historians. We have so many griots. We have so many people living, uh, people in their uh, 70s, but also younger people who are giving these walking tours still of our neighborhoods that we deserve to elevate. And this can be a walking tour that we offer here in the city. Um, and that should be have the proper markers. Uh, recently, my staff um, and, our, and our families went on the Black Heritage Trail in Beacon Hill. Uh, shout out to the National Park Service. They have a great self-guided virtual tour of the Black Heritage Trail that is an, an amazing, empowering tour that tells the story of those who really uh, fought to make sure that black folks in Boston, black folks coming to Boston could really experience and realize freedom, even in light of the Fugitive Slave Act and all the other barriers to, uh, to true freedom. Um, and Councilor Block joined us on that tour when I called her and said, we're right outside of your house in Beacon Hill on this tour. And she added some really great rich history. So I'm excited about this um, and about really shining a light on the rich history of Dr. King and Coretta, but also of the great black history that we have throughout the city that really deserves to be told and celebrated. So thank you, Councilor Fernandez Anderson, and I look forward to working on this with you. Thank you, Council Eugene. The Chair recognizes Council Bach. Council Bach, you have the floor. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. President. Yes, I am also an enthusiastic, um, please add my name, sponsor of this. Um, I uh, w immediately went to check the list to make sure one Chestnut Street was on it. Um, uh, the house that uh, Coretta Scott King lived in on Beacon Hill, um, I think it's, it's long bothered me that there isn't like a marker there. Um, and I think that, you know, Boston actually piloted in the Freedom Trail, kind of the use of a trail as a way to really drive like economic spending, tourist attention, et cetera. And honestly, like people around the world have copied us um, and the thing that we created with the Freedom Trail. But the challenge really now, if you think about the Freedom Trail is coming in around the bicentennial, the challenge now 50 years on is how do you like push that kind of engagement with history out into our neighborhoods and really make it citywide. Um, and the King story is such an important story for us locally here and for the whole country um, and absolutely should be something that people are coming to Boston to like walk in the footsteps of. So really excited about this um, and I think that these kinds of efforts can uh, actually really help like pull the threads together um, and drive attention and resources and, uh, and also just be a great day out in America's walking city, um, as we enjoyed with the Black Heritage Trail uh, a couple weekends ago with Councilor Louis Jen. So um, please add my name and thank you to the sponsors. Thank you, Council Bach. The chair recognizes Council Laura. Council Laura, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flint. I will be brief because I don't want to belabor the point. I think everybody has talked about the importance um, of this trail. But tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., the Environmental Justice, Resiliency, and Parks Committee is having a meeting about making the Walking City Trail an official trail of the city of Boston. And although uh, we are going to be talking about that specific trail and signage, part of the hearing order is to attempt to create a program and an office that would be focused on specifically creating urban trails and unifying urban trails through a civic engagement process all across the city. And so to see the birth of new trails in the city that will ultimately add to the trails that already exist, like the Harbor Walk, the Black Heritage Trail, it is really affirming for me that we're kind of moving in that direction where people 
the city of Boston can decide what are the important places in their community, what are the, how do they want to highlight these places, and that we can have infrastructure in the city to really make that happen. And so I'm really excited to see this, and my hope is that we can see the upcoming and the popping up of multiple urban trails in the city of Boston. Thank you. Thank you, Council Laura. I will speak on this as well. I, I also wanted to highlight one of my colleagues who mentioned um, Representative Mel King, and just recently myself and Councilor Fernandez Anderson um, and my colleagues here in the City Council supported a resolution to rename a public school after uh, Representative Mel King as well, and that will be taking place shortly. It was actually going to be this week. Um, I referenced that also because of the important role the historic 12th Baptist Church plays in our city where Dr. Martin Luther King preached when he was, when he was here in Boston. And another remarkable pastor was Reverend Michael Haynes that many of us here have met. And we know Reverend Michael Haynes's commitment as well. So um, during these difficult times, we're also wanted to know that Rep. Mel King and, and Rever Reverend um, Haynes played a critical part in bringing the city, city together. Let me recognize Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I just wanted to um, shout out to um, the Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Inc., uh, who, which um, Dr. King was a proud member of um, by way of Sigma chapter, um, as well as uh, Sister Coretta K Scott King uh, was a proud member of um, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Inc. Um, so shout out to those sororities and fraternities. Um, and again, um, asking to suspend the rules and pass this resolution today. Thank you. Thank you, Council Fernandez Anderson. Please raise your hand um, to uh, sign on. Mr. Cora, please add Council Arroyo, Council Baker, Council Ball, Council Braden, Council Coletta, Council Flaherty, Council Lara, Council Murphy, please add the chair. Council Fernandez Anderson. Um, seek suspension of the rules and adoption of docket 0461. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket has been adopted. Mr. Clerk, can we do a roll call vote, please? Roll call vote on docket 0461. Councilor Arroyo. Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker. Aye. Councilor Baker, aye. Councilor Bark. Councilor Bark, aye. Councilor Braden. Aye. Councilor Braden, aye. Councilor Coletta. Yes. Councilor Coletta, yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, yes. Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn. Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Lara. Yes. Councilor Lara, yes. Councilor Louisiana. Yes. Councilor Louisiana, yes. Councilor Mejia. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Murphy, yes. And Councilor Worrell. Yes. Councilor Worrell, yes. Docket number 0461 has received 12 votes in the affirmative. Thank you. That docket has been adopted. Mr. Clerk, we're on to docket 0462. Please. Docket number 0462, Councilors Murphy and Flynn offer the following. Resolution recognizing Irish American Heritage Month. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. The, the chair recognizes Councilor Murphy. Councilor Murphy, you have the floor. Thank you, Council President Flynn. And I ask that we suspend Rule 12 and add Councilor Flaherty, if that's okay. Hearing no objection, Councilor Flaherty is added. The chair recognizes Councilor Murphy. Thank you. Um, over the last two centuries, Irish immigrants have made great contributions to our city and country while generations of Irish-American residents have enriched all aspects of our city and our nation's history. And during this month, which started today, March 1st, we celebrate and honor the remarkable achievements and contributions of Irish-Americans. Their, re their resiliency and perseverance, commitment to social and economic justice, strong sense of community, and proud immigrant heritage have helped shape our city and our nation's identity and made us a stronger people. So we're asking that the Boston City Council recognizes March as Irish American Heritage Month in the city of Boston and pays tribute to the wonderful contributions of the Irish American community. In recognition of Irish American Heritage Month, the Boston City Council orders, seems like a strong word, so I'd like to say just asks nicely to the property management department 
to raise the flag on March 17th, 2023. Thank you, Council President Flynn. Thank you, Council Murphy. The chair recognizes Council of Flaherty. Council of Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank the lead sponsor for including me. Obviously, the contributions are immeasurable, uh, despite many difficult circumstances as our <coughs> ancestors coming over here. And we're met also with the prejudice and discrimination, and no Irish need apply. And so for a very resilient uh, group and persevered uh, through tough times, and again, they've made great contributions to the city, uh, to our country, and to our world. So. That's I look forward to celebrating with all of uh, my colleagues. Uh, we're all Irish for the month of March, just so you know. So uh, we're plenty of green. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Flaherty. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? The chair recognizes Councilor Braden. Councilor Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I do come from the island of Ireland, and very proudly so. Uh, I want to thank uh, Councilor Murphy and Councilor Flynn for offering this resolution to recognize Irish um, American Heritage Month. Um, you know, it's interesting, we have a long and storied history in Boston, I think it predates um, the 1840s. The Charitable Irish Society of Boston was founded in 1737 and is the oldest Irish organisation in North America. Its early charitable efforts focused around temporary loans and assistance for finding work for um, Irish immigrants, very much similar to the organisations that are supporting other immigrants from other countries, uh, finding a foot, foothold in Boston, uh, getting them started and getting them established. Uh, I know this is a tradition in the Haitian community and others. Um, the Irish immigrants have landed on these shores for centuries and uh, forced to leave their homelands uh, the homeland for economic deprivation, political persecution, and, and just this in just seeking a, a better life in a new country. Um, I want to recognise the spiritual support uh, provided by the Irish Pastoral Centre for seniors who emigrated from Ireland in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, many, when you go and have tea with them and talk with them, they came here. Many of them came to work in the health as healthcare assistants, uh, personal care assistants, and and LPNs. Uh, many of them came from the west of Ireland. English was not their first language, uh, and they made an immeasurable contribution to our communities here in Boston. And they also want to recognise the work in a more contemporary context of the Irish International Immigration Centre, formerly the Irish Immigrant Centre, that offers job training, immigrant legal assistance, and English language classes to immig immigrants from all over the world. And uh, I'm very excited and proud to celebrate um, Irish Heritage Month in Boston. And also a little bit of trivia for you. Um, I have the Irish flag in our office, actually. If you need a flag to run up the pole, it's, uh, I, Matt O'Malley gave it to me as he walked out the door. So uh, the Irish tricolor, the tricolor as it's called, green, white, and orange, was first uh, made in 1848. Uh, it represents, the green represents Catholics, the orange represents Irish Protestants, and the white colour stands for the harmony and concord, concord that both, these, both parties were hoping to achieve in 1848. So I hope uh, we have a grand time celebrating and uh, blessing the shamrock and having a glass of the black stuff. Um, and happy St. Patrick's Day. We'll, we'll celebrate that in two weeks' time, but happy Irish American Heritage Month. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Braden. The Chair recognizes Councillor Coletta. Councillor Coletta, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. I just want to uh, rise to thank the makers for bringing this forward. Uh, Charlestown is the oldest neighborhood in Boston. It's largely forgotten about as being a, a major enclave of Irish Americans here in the city of Boston. And I have to thank all of them for welcoming this Eastie girl over, over the bridge, over the Charlestown Bridge is what I'll call it today as, as I'm giving my remarks. Um, but just have to give a shout out to the Donovans, the Colliers, the Callahans, the Fitzpatricks, the Walshes, the Kellys, um, all incredible families who have really made their mark in this city and who have lifted each other up um, uh, without the, the help of, of other neighborhoods and in their minds, um, largely without help of the city over the last couple of years. And so I just wanted to rise and lend my support and look forward to celebrating St. Patrick's Day here in the city of Boston with everybody, and especially those here in Charlestown. Thank you. Thank you, Col Thank you, Councilor Quetta. The chair recognizes Councilor uh, Fernandez Anderson. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to uh, the original sponsor, Councillor uh, Murphy. Um, I rise in support um, to this resolution, and it is important 
uh, for all people to recognize and celebrate their heritage. Um, everyone in America, whether born here or brought here uh, by ancestral heritage, um, that shape who they are today um, and their identity. Um, recognizing struggles, stories, successes in the best way is, is the best way to honor a, a heritage. And each story should even be taught in schools. Uh, moreover, um, it's our duties as Irish Americans, Italian Americans, German Americans, Scottish Americans, British Americans, or all European Americans and African Americans for us to uplift each other and continue to honor each other um, in our heritage. Uh, Boston has a strong Irish American community and they should be celebrated um, in their heritage be recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fernandez Anderson. The chair recognizes Councillor Louis Jen. Councillor Louis Jen, you have the floor. Uh, thank you and thank you to the makers. I rise uh, just also to uh, celebrate Irish American Heritage Month. Council Flaherty, I've saved all my green, so looking forward to it. Um, I think that there's a lot of connectedness between the struggles of Irish immigrants, obviously, and uh, black immigrants um, when they came. And you can see that now with that, but uh, Councilor Braden alluded to, or mentioned the, the Rian Center, which has been as aggressive on fighting Title 42 and the Biden administration and the racism and the xenophobia embedded in our immigration policy. So um, there's a lot of camaraderie and a lot of synergy there in, in our fights and in realizing that we are stronger when we work together. Um, I have had the pleasure, of course, I grew up in Boston, of having a number of, of, of friends uh, teach me about um, Irish history and culture, and I've had the pleasure of traveling to Ireland, and I look forward to going back to, to learning so much more. Um, I accounted a credit to the city that we have such diversity and that our neighborhoods often tell the story of our changing demographics, but of, you know, this was a place where the Irish lived and that's where the then Jewish communities came and the black communities came and those neighborhoods still carrying those stories. So um, I, I look forward to us being able to be in shared spaces more where we find those uh, shared stories of solidarity and continue to think about how we can work together, whether it's on immigration issues or on housing issues or uh, on the issues that, that face all of our communities and the things that bring us together. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Council Louis Jean. The chair recognizes Council Alara. Council Alara, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. Uh, I'm excited to stand in support of this. Please add my name and to Councillor Flaherty's invitation, have absolutely no qualms with being Irish in the month of March because um, the Irish people, Irish immigrants, and people in Ireland have been a very big part of my own uh, political development and my own work in social justice. They have taught me a lot. It was actually uh, one of the Irish centers here in Boston that hosted myself and Bob Moses when I was very young to have a conversation mm -hmm. about racial justice in Boston public schools. And I got <laughs> to have a talk with one of my heroes thanks to the work, the social justice work um, of the Irish center here in the city of Boston. Uh, obviously, I would be remiss if I didn't mention Ireland's socialist history and a lot of the work that they've done. And for me, I've learned a lot from socialist feminist movements in Ireland. And um, Ireland has also welcomed Frederick Douglass there and a lot mm -hmm. of other black leaders to really have conversations around not only the abolition of slavery, but black liberation in the United States and how they could be supportive. And so I think to Councillor Louis Jen's point, we have a long history of working together, particularly for black liberation and the liberation and justice of Irish people. So as someone who represents West Roxbury, who has a very, very uh, long line of the old Irish here in Boston, I'm really excited to celebrate in March and hope that we're having more conversations about how much we have in common uh, during that time. Thank you. And thank you, Council Laura. Let me, let me also add, I'm honored to be part of this resolution in proclaiming March um, in honor of the Irish community here in Boston, but also when I think of the Irish community in, in the United States, I think I've, my first thought is with the famine that happened 150, 150 years ago. We celebrated, we recognized it here at the city council, but that's the first thing that pops up to my mind when I think of the Irish community and how they left and they called them coffin ships at that time coming to, coming to America, where many more were died because of, the because of the potato blight in Ireland. But I think that's where the Irish get their commitment to social and economic justice. Council Arroyo and others were talking about food access today. And I think that's where the Irish really are champions of social and economic justice 
and those without food, those without, those without water, those without a house, and that, that goes all the way back to the famine time. So thank you, for all, thank you to all my colleagues for the incredible work they're doing in, in representing the rights of, of all immigrants, really. Please raise, your, please raise your hand if you'd like to add, be added to this. Uh, Mr. Chair, please add Council Arroyo, Council Baker, Council Ball, Council Braden, Council Coletta, Council Fernandez Anderson, Council Flaherty, Council Lara, Council Louis Jean, Council Council Worrell. Yeah. Council. Councilor Murphy and Council Flynn seek suspension of the rules and adoption of, of docket 0462. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket has been adopted. Thank you, Council Murphy. Uh, Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0464, please. Doc <clears throat> docket number 0464. Councilor Murphy offered the following order requesting certain information under section 17F regarding Boston Public Schools transportation follow-up on a previous request. <clears throat> Thank you, the Chair recognizes Councilor Murphy. Councilor Murphy, you have the floor. Thank you, Council President Flynn. I have to start by saying I never thought I would be filing so many 17 Fs on the Council. It hurts a little, but after advocating for several families who are struggling with different issues in BPS, I got a call from the mayor's office a couple weeks ago telling me I should call the State Ethics Commission to ensure I'm not violating Section 23. A few days later, I was told by Claire and IGR that I was not allowed to work with Annie or Liz in our BPS Intergovernmental Relations Department any longer and needed to ask everything through her. Unfortunately, many of my questions and data requests are still not answered. So I feel forced to use our tool through 17F to get the data I need, our office needs, to continue working on the supports we need for our residents. I do just want to add, um, providing constituent services has always been part of what elected politicians are supposed to do. The City of Boston Charter states, the City Council serves as a link between the citizens of Boston in their municipal government. Councilors help constituents by connecting them to resources, services, and city departments. They serve as advocates for all Bostonians. Through their work, city councilors make sure Boston continues to be a great place to live, work, and play. So making sure I am doing my job, I am asking for this information again. We are aware that on-time AM bus arrival data that BPS submits to DESE omits a large portion of data for planned arrival routes. 25% of our routes are missing data. I am requesting that 75% of the data that BPS does share, we request the following information, which was based on my previous 17F that I'm still trying to get some more clarification on. The number of students each day that did not get picked up by their assigned school bus the number of times a backup bus was needed to be sent out. We calculated that on average 51.7 students are on, are on uncovered buses each day and an average of 5.6 students per day have a backup bus sent to them. This means the Boston Public Schools does not pick up 46.1 students per day via the bus that is assigned to transport them to school safely and on time. Many of these students arrive very late or not make it to school at all. A high percentage of students assigned to school buses are on IEPs, which means many of our special education students are missing critical specialized services and therapies. We are still waiting, uh, my office is still waiting on responses to the following questions. And despite BPS telling us that they do not have data on bus student arrival times available by student or by school, we know that BPS utilizes ASPEN, which is the district's student information tracking system. And each school is required to record absences in time of tardies for each student each day. I know this firsthand also for over 20 years. I took attendance every morning and any time a student arrived past 
the morning attendance time, you did have to record exactly what time they arrived at school. So the two questions are, one, the actual time the student arrived at school if their bus was late, a backup bus was sent, or if the bus did not pick them up at all. The number of students across the system this happens to on a daily basis since September 9th, 2022, and the number of students by school this happens to on a daily basis, so by school and by system. And the second question is, how many of these students miss an entire day of school because of their unreliable bus system? And I would like the numbers for students across the system since the first day of school this year and the number of students by school. So I'm requesting that the Boston Public School through the mayor provide any and all information that is available regarding this matter. Thank you, Council President Flynn. Thank you, Council Murphy. Council Murphy seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0464. All those in favor say aye. 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 I'll both say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Rancho personnel orders. <coughs> Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0465. Docket number 0465. Council of Flynn for Council. The chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage Anderson. of docket 0465. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0466. Docket number 0466. Council of Flynn for Council of Flynn Anderson. The chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0466. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, please read docket. 0467. Docket number 0467. Councilor Flynn for Councilor Murphy. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of Docket 0467. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. I'm sorry. Um, can you repeat the question? on the agenda. Yes. We'll take a quick recess. Session. <laughs> Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0467. Document 0467, Councilor Flynn for Councilor Murphy. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0467. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0468. Docket number 0468, Council Flynn for Council Flaherty. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0468, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay, the ayes have it, the docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0469. Docket number 0469, Councilor Flynn for Councilor Fernandez. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket <coughs> 0469, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay, the ayes have it, the docket is passed. We're on to late files. I am informed by the clerk that there are, I think, 10. ten. I think there are 10 additional late file matters. Um, the additional late file matters include two appointment letters from the mayor, absent letter from Council Mejia, at least four personnel orders, a resolution from myself and Councilor uh, Fernandez Anderson. Um, Mr. Mr. Clerk, there were, there was one other one? And two 17Fs. There, there were two other 17Fs um, from Councilor Murphy, I'm going to stop for a second to make sure everyone has these late file matters on their desk. You don't have the Mejia letter? I have Mejia. I have them. The, I, I, will, I, will get, I will get everyone the uh, Council Mejia letter that he's making up. Can we please ensure everyone has both 17 Fs, please? Ron is in the process of passing it out now. Thank you, Ron. Okay.
Now, does everybody have the proper documents before them? Yes. I'm getting a couple thumb, thumbs up, which I take as, as a yes. Um, we'll, t we'll take a vote to add these items into the formal agenda. All those in favor of adding all of these late file matters into the agenda, say aye. 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 Thank you. These late file matters have been added to the agenda. Mr. Clerk, in the interest of time um, with some of our guests, could I, could I go to the um, first late file matter, which is an order uh, resolution for myself and Councilor Fernandez Anderson? Order offered by Councilor Zed Flynn and Tanya Fernandez Anderson, resolution in support of Boston Firefighters Local 718 and urging the Massachusetts Civil Service Human Resources Division to work in good faith on the issue of civil service promotional exams. President Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Council Braden. Councilor Braden, may we suspend Rule 12 and add Councilor louis -Jean? Seeing and hearing no objection, uh, Councilor louis is added. Thank you, Councilor Braden. And I want to acknowledge the professional membership from Local 718 that is here with us today. Sam Dillon, Leroy Hayward, and my neighbor in South Boston, Leo Greeley. This resolution is in support of Boston Firefighters Local 718, who are working with the Massachusetts Civil Service Human Resources Division on this issue of civil service promotional exams. I want to say thank you to the important work of Council Fernandez Anderson. The firefighters promotional exam has long been used for promotion of firefighters and selection of leadership within the fire department. And many fire departments prepare for months or even a year for this exam. The city of Boston is unique in its infrastructure. And the Boston Fire Department is thus unique in its operation. And the exam has included Boston specific content. Yet, the Massachusetts Civil Service Human Resources Division is now looking to remove Boston specific content from the exam, with the reasoning being that it would address concerns raised by a legal challenge regarding racially disparate treatment. However, including Boston-specific content does not impede efforts to promote fairness and equity in the promotion process, but rather it supports and furthers those efforts. The Boston firefighters are now having issues working with the Civil Service Human Resource Division out of the state and is hoping that they will work with them in good faith. This resolution asks for the City Council to support our firefighters and urge the Civil Service Human Resources Division to work with them as well in good faith. I did recognize my council, uh, council colleagues, Council Fernandez Anderson and Council Louis Jean, but all of you have been very helpful. Um, in support of this, but I also want to acknowledge Councillor Flaherty as well for the important work you have done, Councillor Flaherty. But I hope we can suspend and adopt this today, and I'm looking forward to um, hearing from my colleagues as well. Um, thank you, Councillor Braden. Thank you, uh, President Flynn. Councillor uh, Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. Um Madam Chair, uh, Councillor President Flynn, thank you so much for adding me as a co-sponsor. Um, I find that this is uh, exceptionally important. I think it's important for us to go on record in support of our um, firefighters in terms of how they're taking their exams. And here you see that this resolution definitely addresses that the changes already um, address the issues with um, increasing diversity in the fire department, as well as just a racially disparate treatment of the firefighters. Um, of uh, black and brown firefighters. So I am in, of course, full support and um, again, grateful for being added as a co-sponsor and look forward to your uh, vote today for us to uh, support our firefighters. Thank you so much. 
Councillor Louis-Jean, you have the floor. Thank you, Councillor Braden, um, and thank you to Councillors Flynn, Council President Flynn, and, and Councillor Fernandre Anderson. Um, I rise in support um, and, and acknowledgement of the incredible work of our firefighters, um, a lot who have been in limbo because of um, the actions and the inactions of the state that has really sowed confusion. Uh, there's a legal decision, Tatum, that really addressed uh, what we know is the racially disparate treatment of uh, a lot of uh, folks in the civil service process. This is, an, an, uh, this is to combat not that, it is to support the Tatum decision and its call to really acknowledge and uh, dismantle a lot of the racial discrimination that folks face in the process. But this is about making sure that the questions within the new format are Boston specific, which I think is a reasonable ask from our firefighters to also bake some certainty in the process. Uh, folks who are, have been preparing um, and are ready to uh, move up in the department deserve to have questions that are pertain to Boston and Boston experiences and not uh, other states or scenarios that have nothing to do with the city or what it is like to be a firefighter in the city, a city um, which a lot of the questions right now wouldn't be relevant to what it's actually like uh, or what the materials are or what, uh, what a fire uh, truck is equipped with. A lot of that has nothing to do with what Boston firefighters actually have. And so this is a reasonable request and I think the state really needs to do a good job of providing some predictability for our firefighters. And so I'm in support of this resolution and the work that we can do on the council to really um, what I think should be uh, a pretty simple fix that we can get us there and help get them there. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Louis-Jean. Anyone else wish to speak on this matter? Uh, Councillor uh, Royal and then Councillor Baker. Councillor Royal first. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to also note that it's not just a matter of uh, the subject matter not being rela related to the way that Boston firefighters do their job, but that some of the answers that would be considered correct with this new format are actually wrong in Boston. So to get the answer correct on this promotional exam, you would actually have to put the wrong answer in for Boston. Uh, and I think that by itself uh, sort of speaks for itself. We shouldn't be creating a promotional exam in which you get extra credit points or you get the right answer because you got the actual wrong answer in practice. And so uh, hopefully the state does uh, something on this. I know that we're coming up on a deadline in March. And so uh, I, this has my full support and I hope to see the state take action on this. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Royal. Councilor Baker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, as we all know, uh, the Boston Fire Department is, I believe, the first and the best in the nation. And what makes them different, one of the, one of the, one of the glaring differences is the fact that we, they proactively fight because we're in a dense area. If you're in Pittsfield or Rehoboth or someplace like that, you're fighting a fire that's a farmhouse, they're just going to fight from, from the outside and let the building burn down. We're unable to do that here because the densely packed buildings that we have, and if you just let it go, then, then um, more buildings will catch on fire. And, and Bellflower Street comes, comes to mind for me. Bellflower Street's in the Polish Triangle in my neighborhood. I think in, it was the 60s, 68, 69, there were something like eight to 10 uh, three-deckers that went on fire. We lost almost half the street in that, in that one fire, and that's why the Boston Fire Department, when, when there is a fire, they proactively fight. They try and stop that fire in the building to contain instead of just being having the convenience to stay outside and fight it from the outside. So that's one big difference. If you sat with a firefighter, they'd be able to tell you 20 differences. That's one big difference that I know of and, 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 and wanted to just bring that to people's attention and I will be in support of this today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Lara, you have the floor. Oh, beg your pardon, I'm missing people. <laughs> Okay. Go ahead, go ahead. All right. Councillor Coletta is next. Thank you so much, Councillor Braden. I just want to join the chorus of support for this resolution. I want to start off by commending the incredible work and advocacy of the 718's new president, Sam Dillon, in his short time in leadership. I think that this is exactly the kind of work that we want to support and we want to advocate for our fires in the, firefighters in the city. Please add my name, and I'm happy to vote in support of this resolution today. Thank you. Councillor Coletta. 
Thank you so much, Council, or Councilor Braden. I rise to lend my formal support to our firefighters, as I said that I would um, and happily do. If you've ever been on the scene at a fire, you understand and, and see firsthand just how brave and courageous these individuals are. These men and women really are the superheroes uh, among us. And so, um, of course, we welcome the changes uh, from the Tatum decision. Although, as Councilor Royal mentioned, it is incredibly confusing to have a question on an exam that is incorrect for Boston. And so, I join the chorus in just calling for um, some predictability and some um, clarity from the state. So, please add my name to this resolution and always standing with our firefighters. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, who would like to add their names? Uh, Councilor Royal, Councilor Bay. Oh. Oh, beg your pardon. <laughs> Sorry, I should have put my glasses on. Uh, Councillor Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just to, to be brief, uh, that's the akin. What we're looking at is uh, changing the rules in the middle of the game. Boston firefighters signed up to take the test after working hard, paid a fee, studied extremely hard, and now um, you know, the state's uh, HR is trying to, I guess, change the rules in the middle of the game. So we're looking for an expedited process and have that test as scheduled. I believe it's the end of the month, if I'm not mistaken. March 25th. March 25th. Have that exam held on March 25th. And for those that don't know how that works, those that have already signed up for the exam, the longer that the exam is put off, it allows others that right now do not qualify for the exam because of the, they're relatively new on the job, then they'll be able to qualify for the next test, which expands the pool, which is not fair to those that are currently on the job. They've got experience and they've uh, studied for the exam. And so you got all these moving parts that are just not fair and frankly will subject the state to multiple lawsuits. For those that are currently in the queue to take the test, to continue to prejudice them uh, will, uh, will just cause more litigation. It won't solve the problem that we're looking to do, which is we want to put a test that's fair, uh, that's balanced, but also understands the city, the rules of the city, and also brings in and fosters uh, the diversity that we need on the department. So they're accomplishing nothing by delaying this exam and by not giving uh, the members of 718 a seat at the table to at least advance the Boston questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Flaherty. Um, okay, who would like to add their name? Councillor Arroyo, Councillor Baker, Councillor Bach, Councillor Coletta, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Lara, Councillor Murphy, and please add my name. Councillor, um, President Flynn seeks suspension of the rules and passage of this um, resolution. Resolution. All those in favour say aye. Aye. All those in, against, nay? Mr. Clark, could you please uh, take a roll call vote? Roll call vote on resolution regarding civil service exams. Councillor uh, Felix Arroyo. I mean, sorry, Councillor Arroyo. Ricardo. <laughs> Ricardo Arroyo. <laughs> I, I had a flashback. <laughs> I was here. I was here. Why she was? He was here with both of you. That's right. <laughs> Councillor Arroyo. Yes. Councillor Baker. Aye. Councillor Baker. Aye. Councillor Buck. Aye. Councillor Buck. Aye. Councillor Braden. Aye. Councillor Braden. Aye. Councillor Coletta. Yes. Councilor Coletta, yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Yes. Council Fernandez Anderson, yes. Council Flaherty. Yes. Council Flaherty, yes. Council Flynn. Yes. Council Flynn, yes. Council Lara. Yes. Council Lara, yes. Council Lujan. Yes. Council Lujan, yes. Council Mejia. Councilor Murphy. Yes. <laughs> Councilor Murphy, yes. And Council Worrell. This uh, first late file receives 11 votes in the affirmative. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. This resolution is passed. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Braden, and thank you to the dedicated and professional Boston Fire Department that we have. Mr. Clerk, do you want to go through the um, late? Do you want to go through the personnel orders now? Okay, Mr. Clerk, Mr. Clerk, can you read the late file matter into the record um, regarding a letter from Council Mejia? From the Office of City Councilor Julia Mejia. Dear Council President Flynn, I am writing to inform you of my absence today at the City Council meeting. A representative from my staff will be listening in and following up with me. I will thoroughly review the video and meeting minutes. I ask you that you please read this matter into the public record. Thank you, Councilor Mejia. That will be placed on file. 
Um, yeah, okay. Mr. Clerk, we have two appointment letters from the mayor. Could you please read those into the record? From the office of Michelle Wu, dear Clerk Jordans, I am I, in accordance with provisions of Section 5-5.10 of the City of Boston Municipal Code, I hereby appoint Paul Chung of West Roxbury as the Registrar of the City of Boston, effective January 23, 2023. And the second appointment letter in accordance with provisions of Section 5-5.10 of the City of Boston Municipal Code, I hereby appoint John Borders of uh, Rosendale as Director of Tourism, Sports, and Entertainment for the City of Boston, effective January 23, 2023. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Those will be placed on file. The the next late file matters into the record. Yeah, which are personnel orders, please. First personnel order for, by Council of Flint for Council of Worrell. The chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of this late file matter. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. This late file matter has passed. Council of Flint for Council of Worrell. The chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of this late file matter. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. This late file matter has passed. Council of Flint for Council Louisiana. The chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of this late file matter. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. The, this late file matter has passed. And Council of Flint for Council of Fernandez Anderson. The chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of this late file matter. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed say nay. This late file matter has passed. The, the next late file matter, uh, Mr. Clerk. Offered by City Councilor uh, Aaron Murphy, a request for a Section 17F regarding the Boston Public Schools. The, those are, those are um, two 17Fs? Two. Do you want to? Yeah. Yeah, yeah please re, uh, read both of those um, the, together, Mr. Clerk. The second 17F offered by Councilor Aaron Murphy uh, regarding breakdown of data collected through the Boston Public Schools Office of Equity. Okay. Thank you. The, the chair recognizes Councilor Murphy on, on both of those 17F late file matters. Thank you, and I just want to apologize to my colleagues for these late files, but I was waiting on this information and still haven't received it after 10 on Monday, so I will be brief. Um, I filed hearing order docket 0341 on February 1st to address concerns that many of our BTU members were still waiting on retro pay. That was um, changes made to the contract, so they were still waiting on that pay. And then two weeks later, um, I started getting calls from several BTU members concerned because an email they rece received on 216. So on February 16th, 2023, an email was sent from Natasha Charles at Boston Public Schools to some of our Boston Teachers Union members, informing them that an overpayment was made on check issue 2-3-2023 due to a system processing error and that they now owe BPS money back. So the same teachers who were waiting for back pay then received an email that they owed money back. So on February 21st, 2023, um, I put in an email. I had made a few calls before that and had spoken also to Jessica Tang at the BTU. But on February 21st, 2023, nine days ago, I emailed Claire Kelly and IGR asking specific questions so I could have clarification and support the <coughs> teachers and other BTU members that had reached out concerned. These questions have still not been answered, so I'm filing a 17F to help ensure that I receive the information so I can properly support our teachers. Those questions are how many BTU members received the email I copied below. The email states, subject ELT memo, ELT is an acronym for extended learning time. Hello all, this email is to inform you of an overpayment due to a system processing error. You were overpaid on ELT on this check issue 2-3-2023. Payroll has corrected the discrepancy and communication will be sent out to each employee detailing the overpayment amount and options you have for repayment. So my questions are how many BTU members received the email, how many BTU members were overpaid and now need to pay back the difference. What payback options are being offered to those affected by this error? And what is the total dollar amount of overpayment made by BPS? So that is my first 17F. 
My second 17F, I've requested on several occasions a breakdown of the data collected through the BPS Office of Equity, which investigates allegations of possible violations of EQT-3, which defines sexual misconduct broadly as any sexual inappropriate comments and or behaviors of any kind. The superintendent circular EQT-3 and the related protocols are consistent with the district's obligation to investigate and address all allegations of sexual misconduct, including possible sexual harassment under state and federal law. Sexual violence may include criminal acts such as indecent assault and battery, rape, abuse, or assault with intent to rape. Any acts that may be criminal will be referred to law enforcement. The examples that BPS uses in this circular are unwelcoming sexual touching, non-consensual sexual conduct that occurs during school or non-school hours on or off school grounds, including dating violence, recruiting, transporting, obtaining, or providing a student of any gender for the purpose of sex. <clears throat> the total number of sexual violence allegations reported in school year 2021-2022 were 32. And so far this school year, 2022-2023, there have been 13. Sexual misconduct includes unwelcome conduct of a sexual nature that denies or limits on the basis of sex a student's ability to participate in or to receive benefits, services, or opportunities in the school program or activities. Sexual misconduct, depending upon the totality of the circumstances, the ages of the student or other individuals involved, and the severity and pervasiveness of the conduct include but are not limited to sexual advances, whether or not they involve touching, requests for sexual favors, making an educational decision or benefit contingent upon a student's submission to unwelcome sexual conduct, offensive public sexual display of affection including groping, fondling gestures or inappropriate touching of oneself or others, consensual groping, fondling, sexual touching or sex on school property or at any school sponsored activity, sexual jokes or references, comments regarding a student's body or a student's sexual activity or orientation, offensive name calling or profanity that is sexually suggestive, sexually degrading or based on sexual stereotypes or sexual orientation different treatment because of pregnancy status, displaying or distributing sexually explicit drawings, pictures, or other materials in any form, such as sexting, trafficking of youth for sexual purposes, such as recruiting, transporting, or otherwise exploiting a minor in exchange for money, shelter, or food, sexual advances or contact, whether or not they are consensual, between a student and an employee, contractor, or community partner, sexual activity between students in a school or any building where BPS business is conducted, and other verbal, nonverbal, or physical conduct of a sexual nature. I took the time to read all of them, which we can all access if we go on to the superintendent circular, EQT-3, because I do think it's important to know that for any teacher, school administrator, nurse, any mandated reporter, which I was and continue to be, to feel that any behavior has risen to the level that they needed to fill out this specific form, that is, it's, it's disturbing to me, because many, I feel, are disregarding the severity of any of these types of misbehavior to our students or other colleagues. So. The total number of sexual misconduct allegations reported in school year 2021-2022 were 712. And so far this school year, 2022-2023, there have been 525. If we go with the math, we will be ending the year if it continues over 1,000 this school year alone. I'm requesting again the breakdown of these allegations, not just the total number. I have attached the chart that I believe should help clear up any misunderstandings BPS has on the data I am requesting. Breakdown of data on the superintendent circular for this, both school years for those defined as sexual violence, not considered sexual misconduct, and also those for both school years defined as sexual misconduct, not considered sexual violence. And I have attached the chart 
to make sure. It's important, I think, to me to make sure they are saying that they just have a total number, but for any description, you have to write up a report, you have to say what happened, and when you're saying what happened, and you're accusing a student of doing it, or a student is coming to you because they feel like they've been the victim, we have to make sure we're keeping both safe in this situation. So I am requesting that this data is broken down so we can really see what types of sexual misconducts are happening in our schools. The number to me is alarming. It may not be to everyone in the city, but to me, I think it's important also to get the information correct so there's no allegations of trying to make this bigger than it is. To me, it's a big deal. I'll continue to advocate to make sure all of our students are safe in school or at any school activity. So thank you to my colleagues for allowing me to file these late. Thank you, Council Murphy. The chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of <clears throat> this late file docket, which is a 17F. The first one. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. This late file matter, which is a 17F, has been passed. The chair seeks a su suspension of the rules and passage of the second late file matter, which is the second 17 F from Council Murphy. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. This late file matter, 17 F, has passed. <clears throat> Mr. Clerk, we're on to the next late file matter. We're all done. We're all done with it. Okay. We're on to green sheets. Anyone wishing to take something out of the green sheets may do so at this time. I know Councilor Louis Jen and Councilor Baker both have, um, have something out of the green sheets. Let me go to Councilor Louis Jen first. Councilor Louis Jen, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to pull docket number 0120, titled Message in Order Authorizing the City of Boston to Accept and Expand the Amount of $160,000 in the form of a grant for the Immigrant Advancement Fund. Thank oh, that's you. your job. Yeah. My bad. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 0120 into the record? From the Committee on Civil Rights and Immigrant Advancement, docket number 0120. Message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $160,000 in the form of a grant from the Immigrant Advancement Fund awarded by the donor group to be administered by the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Advancement. The grant will fund programs, initiatives, events, and small grants that enable immigrants to play an active role in the economic, civic, social, and cultural life of the City of Boston. Mr. Clerk, can you pull the committee to ensure that this docket is properly before the body? The Committee on Civil Rights and Immigrant Advancement, Council Louis Jen. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Mejia. Councilor Arroyo. Yes. Councilor Coletta. This stock at 0120 is now properly before the body. The chair recognizes Council Louis Jean. Council Louis Jean, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, uh, Mr. Clerk. This grant would fund programs, initiatives, events, and offer mini grants uh, from Moya, the Moya's Office of Immigrant Advancement, to help our immigrant communities play an active role in the economic, civic, social, and cultural life in our city. Uh, specifically, it will enable funding to support the mental health and wellness of. Um, our immigrant communities, such as initiatives for family, wealth, and uh, health and wellness, and community cultural events during Immigrant Heritage Month in June. We continue to hear from our immigrant communities, our new arrivals, and immigrant, long established immigrant communities about a lot of the mental health challenges and the trauma that uh, many of our uh, immigrant communities are facing. And so I'm excited to get this uh, money to Moya for them to think strategically about how to uh, support our. Uh, immigrant communities um, and um, with integration and also with addressing the mental health needs of our immigrants, especially our young people. So um, I ask for us to pass this. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Council Louis Jean. Council Louis Jean seeks suspension of the rules in passage of docket 0120. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. 
this docket has passed. We're on to the second matter from Councilor Baker. Um, the chair recognizes Councilor Baker. Councilor Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise today to see if you can turn the heat up. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, I have a, I have a, um, Mr. I'll read the first one because we're on different pages. I'm looking to pull docket 0216 from page 9 and then also pull uh, dockets 0217, 0218, 0220, and 0221 from page 10. Yep. Yep. Mr. Quirk, um, the dockets Councilor Baker mentioned, w will you please read those into the record? From the Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation, docket number 0216. Message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of Edward Brandenburg as a member of the Aberdeen Architectural Conservation District Commission for a term expiring on June 30th, 2026. Docket number 0217. Message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of Andrew Shelbourne as a member of the Highland Park Architectural Conservation District Commission for a term expiring on June 30th, 2026. Docket number 0218. Message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of Ernest Coston as a member of the Highland Park Architectural Conservation District Commission for a term expiring on June 30th, 2024. Docket number 0220. Message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of Suleiman Gajiri as a member of the Highland Park Architectural Conservation District Commission for a term expiring on June 30th, 2024. In docket number 0221, message in order for the confirmation and the appointment of Dr. Angela Page Cook as a me member of the Highland Park Architectural Conservation District Commission for a term expiring on June 30th, 2025. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark, can you pull the committee to ensure that these dockets are properly before the body? The Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation. Councilor Baker. Aye. Councilor Worrell. Councilor Braden. Yes. Councilor Lara. Yes. And Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Properly. These um, dockets are properly before the body. The Chair recognizes Councilor Baker. Councilor Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I decided to move these forward. The, the, the chamber has been f filled up with, with many uh, important important uh, hearing, so I believe these are very much neighborhood-centric. Aber Aberdeen. Aberdeen is in Brighton, and Highland, Highland Park is a, new, a newly formed district in Roxbury, I believe, and we want to allow these commissions to be able to do their business, so, so we're going to just move them forward today if this body sees to it. Thank you. Thank you, Council Baker. Uh, we'll do each docket individually. Council Baker moves for a confirmation of docket 0216. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. This appointment has been confirmed for docket 0216. Council Baker moves for confirmation of docket 0217. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The appointment has been confirmed for docket 0217. Council Baker moves for confirmation of docket 0218. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The appointment has been confirmed for docket 0218. Councilor Baker moves for the confirmation of docket 0220. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The appointment has been confirmed for docket 0220. Councilor Baker moves for the confirmation of docket 0221. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay, the ayes have it. The appointment has been confirmed for docket 0221. Thank you, Council Baker. We're on to the consent agenda. I'm sorry. Uh, the chair recognizes the chair recognizes Council Worrell. Council Worrell, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. And I was just wanted to see if it could be added as a yes for the uh, fire resolution, please. Mr. Quirk. Could we re revisit the resolution on the fire examination? Yeah. And can we add Councilor Worrell as a yes? Yes. 
Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Thank you. Thank you, Council Wirral. <clears throat> We're on to the consent agenda. I've been informed by the clerk that there are zero additions to the consent agenda. The chair moves for the adoption of the consent agenda as presented. All those in favor say aye. Aye. The consent agenda has been adopted. At this time, we're going to do memorials, and I would welcome my colleagues if they would like to talk individually about a particular person, a loved one, a friend, a family member, a constituent. Um, just hit your, um, hit your light, and I'll call on you. Um, but today, we will adjourn our meeting in memory of the following individuals. <clears throat> For Council Arroyo, Mariam Torres. For Council Arroyo and Council Louis Jean, Ramon De Jean. For Council Baker, Flynn, Murphy, and Flaherty, Francis Daly, Teresa Passetti. For Council Coletta, Carmen Patella, and Danny Fester. For Councilor Louis Jean. Carol Lawrence, the grandmother, the grandmother of the late Tyler Lawrence, mother of Remy Lawrence, beloved wife of Stan Lawrence. For Councilor Laura and Councilor Flynn, Reverend Rodney Daly. For Councilor Murphy, Carol Ann Moore. For Councilor Worrell, Diva Ayuso. For the entire council, St. Anasi Filippi, Council of Louis Jen's grandmother, Ryle Rhodes, Local 327 Business Manager, Carpenters Union, Peter Wong. A moment of silence, please. At this time, I will recognize my colleagues. I'll start with Council Arroyo and go around if anyone would like to talk about a loved one that has recently um, passed away. Uh, the, chair, the, the chair recognizes Council Arroyo. Council Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you, and I'll just uh, be brief, uh, brief on this. Uh, Medium Torres uh, was a uh, teacher in BPS, but also was a neighbor, and when I was growing up was the neighbor who uh, watched after me when my parents were busy doing all the things my parents were doing uh, and much of my early memories involved being at her home and having her cook me meals or uh, take care of me as a, as a young kid uh, and so uh, she was suffering from Alzheimer's uh, late in her life uh, and has passed uh, she leaves uh, her children and her uh, her widow uh, she's someone who has been a treasure to many many people uh, it was sad to watch her illness take her and uh, my deepest condolences to her family as they as they work through this time. Thank you. Thank you, Council Roy. I should have mentioned um, on behalf of myself and Council Flaherty, Marie Butler and Elaine Wallace as well. The chair recognizes Councilor Baker. Councilor Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A, a couple people. Um, Peter Wong, of course, was a year younger than me and Ryan Rhodes, a year older than me. Um, just to make sure that we know and understand how precious life is, but I also stand to recognize um, March 3rd is my brother Ricky's 30th anniversary. He died of a heroin overdose on March 3rd. It definitely changed my life, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention the two gentlemen that, that died. Andrew, Andrew um, McDonough was killed on L Street. Um, that, that, June, that June, June 13th, Mausel, Michael Mullen was one of my childhood friends. He shot himself on December 7th, and then I lost my brother Ricky, which he actually called me on the phone and shot himself on the phone to me. It was um, quite traumatic. And then I lost my brother Ricky three, three months later on March 3rd. Those three deaths are together for me, etched on my heart. I actually wear them on a chain that I wear. And um, thank you for allowing me to bring my brother Ricky into the chamber here today, and Andrew, and Mausel, so thank you. Thank you, Council Baker. 
The chair recognizes Councilor Coletta. Councilor Coletta, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. Um, I rise to um, give my condolences to uh, two families in East Boston today, first of which being um, Carmen Pescarello Patella. She was a beloved administrator at East Boston High School, a really good friend of my mother. Um, uh, my heart goes out to her, her two daughters who I played softball with. She was a mainstay on the sidelines at Noyce Park, and so I just wish them um, my thoughts and prayers during this difficult time. And then the second is Gaetano Danny Festa. Um, he was an incredible human being that lived down the street from me on Princeton Street. I had the honor of taking part uh, in a sign unveiling recently this past summer with Commissioner Rob Santiago while he was still with us, and I'm incredibly grateful for that opportunity. Um, but he is a World War II veteran. He married the love of his life in 1949 and Mary and settled um, on Princeton Street in East Boston. That's where a large part of his family still reside. And everybody that knows Danny um, knows him as somebody with a big heart, uh, somebody who was Mr. Fix-It, and he welcomed uh, everybody uh, to East Boston, whether you were um, a resident of 100 years or somebody who just moved in yesterday. So I just uh, rise to give my condolences to his family as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Coletta. The chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez-Anderson. Councilor Fernandez-Anderson, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, uh, Today, uh, I'd like to, um, I guess, honor the life of Brother Rashid, um, who passed away just three days ago. It, it, in the Islamic custom, we do a janaza, which is a funeral, and it took place today. And, um, I am deeply um, sorry to, for the, that I was not able to attend to um, a good friend of mine, his sister, um, Sister Latifa. In Islam, we say, um, from God we come, to God we return, and um, I pray that his sins are forgiven and all of his good deeds are accepted and that God um, give him rest. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Fernandez Anderson. The chair recognizes Councilor Flaherty. Councilor Flaherty of the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. would be remiss if we don't mention uh, Marie Butler and Elaine Wallace, uh, two pillars, uh, two uh, wonderful uh, women from South Boston. Uh, neighborhood won't be the same without both of them uh, in the town. But uh, wanted to note that their legacy uh, is that they both raised great kids, uh, both sets of family, all those kids uh, have made tremendous contributions to the community, uh, to our city and beyond. And so um, they have, uh, you know, they've, they did an amazing job. Uh, and anyone that you know or you bump into uh, that knows the Butlers and or knows uh, the Wallaces, first thing they'll say is how wonderful their mother is, but they'll also note that how well their mothers and their parents did it raising those kids and obviously grandkids and in Marie's case, great grandkids and maybe even great, great grandkids, but two great families, tremendous loss to the community and to the Butlers and the Wallaces. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Flaherty. The chair recognizes Council Lara. Council Lara, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. Um, I often talk about my work as a member, as a street worker, as a member of Street Safe Boston doing gang intervention and violence intervention work. It is some of the most rewarding work that I've done. It's also some of the most difficult work that I've done. And when you do violence intervention work, gang intervention work, and when you're particularly working with the young people who are involved, it is work that takes your heart with it. And you kind of got to put all of your elbow grease um, and work together to make what you need happen for these young people to happen. And so the reason why I rise today is because in the last two months, three black men who I had the honor of serving with at Street Safe Boston have passed away um, all from health issues. So I just wanna um, name Marcus Merritt, Gregory Burnett, and Reverend Rodney E. Daly, who um, we mentioned here today. The reason why I wanted to take a moment to speak on that is because black men for the big part of the work that happens in the city around gang, gun violence and gang violence and violence intervention really take on the brunt of this work. And um, Governor, excuse me, not Governor, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley and um, our council colleague Brian Worrell do an incredible amount of work and to really push the conversation forward about black men deserving to grow old. And we're seeing that these men um, are dying too, too early on, way before their time, and we're losing pillars of our community. And so I just wanted to, one, affirm their work to make sure that we're supporting black and brown men in the city of Boston so that they can age and grow old and care for themselves and their health. 
uh, and really lift up the names of these three men who I had the honor of really working in the trenches with to support so many young people um, to move their lives in a different direction. So thank you. Thank you, Council Hohar. The chair recognizes um, Council Louis-Jean. Council Louis-Jean, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, a lot of you know that last November, and I wrote this because I knew this would be hard. Um, last November, my grandmother passed away. And for the safety of my family, we've not talked about it, but now I'm um, OK to talk about it. She passed away for health reasons at the age of 91. Um, and because of the conditions in Haiti and the suddenness of her passing, I was not able to go to Haiti to bury her. And that will always leave a hole in my heart. My grandmother was a giant. She loved her babies and her grandbabies and her great grandbabies. She knew the whole lot by name, even though she never met. Her laugh was infectious and she laughed a lot. I don't remember seeing her cry until she lost her youngest child in the earthquake. The sounds of her pain still linger. She came to this cold city when I was younger to help raise my sisters and me while my parents grinded it out in around the clock jobs. She looked, she took no nonsense. She shared with us her wisdom and love the way only a grandma can. Life was hard for her. She never went to school. She didn't know how to read or write. Half of the children she carried, she lost either during childbirth or really young. She suffered the injustices that face women in Haiti. But yet, like so many black women, she still made lemonade. She mothered a village, her biological children, kids not biologically her own, nieces, nephews, kids from the block, kids from church. She was the queen of her castle and her neighborhood. She was so giving, she, she taught me so much. Madame Louis was a giant. I think of her today, first day of Women's History Month because she was the greatest woman I've known, because grief is continual and messy, because during Black History Month we honor the ancestors and I've tried to honor her, because our community and people I know are also mourning the loss of grandmothers who are pillars of our families and our neighborhoods, such as Carol Lawrence, who I pray is reunited with her grandson and is at peace. When I graduated from Harvard Law School, I really wanted my grandmother to be there that degree was for her and for all of those who've come before me. But by that point, she was done with this cold city and country, and her health preferred the stability and consistency of the sun. I saw her last in 2020, right before the pandemic, on my last trip to Haiti. I must now learn a Haiti without her, which will be hard. She was the only grandmother I've known, and I miss her. I hope to always hear her laugh, and I hope to always make her proud. Thank you, Council Louis-Jean. I would, I would like to mention not, not a, per, a person's, person by name, but over the last two days, I was at a Disabled American Veterans Conference in, in DC, and the, the staggering number of veterans committing suicide at one time was 25 a day, and now it's down to, now it's, 21 or 20. Um, but I also want to I want to think about and recommit ourselves to supporting our veterans who have who are recently returning home, but dealing with so many mental health challenges and the staggering number of veteran suicide at 21 a day throughout the country is is, is unconscionable. So I want to think about those veterans and their families, although I don't know them per se, but I do know their sacrifice and commitment to our country. The chair moves that when the city council adjourns today, it does so in memory of the above mentioned individuals. And we are now scheduled to meet again in the Ionella chamber on Wednesday, March 8th at 12 noon. Before we adjourn, I want to say thank you to the city clerk and the clerk's team. I want to say thank you to my city council colleagues and your staff, the city council central staff, and of course our lovely um, stenographer as well. <laughs> All in favor of adjournment, please say aye. 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 The council is adjourned. <laughs>